Call the June 2nd City Council meeting to order. Uh, Commissioner Bankson will give us the invocation, and John Latimer will give us the pledge and the fact of the day. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for this beautiful day. And Lord, as we're reminiscent of the memorial, memorial Day that we just celebrated and all those who gave so much that we can have this wonderful freedom and liberty, we just ask you to bless us today. Father, bless our meeting as we seek the best for the, the people. And we ask you, Father, for a prosperous day in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America. America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Here's the fun fact of the day for June 2nd. On June 2nd, 1865, the Civil War ended with Confederate General Edmund Kirby Smith, commander of the Confederate forces west of the Mississippi, signing the surrender terms offered by Union negotiators with Smith's surrender the last Confederate army ceased to exist, bringing a formal end to the bloodiest four years in U.S. history. Thank you. John. Okay. Uh, you should have a, a new set of min minutes in front of you. Uh, I hope everybody's had a chance to take a look at them also or email to you. Oh, you know what? I forgot. No, it's okay. Good. Okay. Uh, any corrections? Not look for a motion to approve? So moved. Got a motion by Commissioner Becker. Second. Second by Commissioner Smith. All those in favor? All right. Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Okay. Best foot forward program. Pam Richmond, I think you're going to introduce. Aha. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. It's Public Youth Council first. I am so sorry. Yes. Dr. Jackson. Mayor and Council, um, I want to present to you today our graduating seniors. Um, our students have worked hard on a video that they would like to show you all today. Um, I'm so proud of this group. They have, many of them have been with me for the past two years. They will be greatly missed. I do have one of the students. He actually was the salutorian at Wekaiva High School. This is our gator that's transferring over to Gainesville, and he will present the video for us today. Thank you, Dr. Jackson. So for our latest project and our like final project for this graduating group right here. So um, speak up loud so everybody on YouTube can, can hear right. you, okay? So for our latest project and the final project for this graduating group right here, the Youth Council set out on highlighting some of the best aspects of the city of Apopka. So as a group, we put together a short video of 10 things we love about Apopka and the community. And we hope that this video we worked on will help bring attention to the best the city has to offer for everyone. Thank you. Can we turn the lights a little? We love Apaka for our public safety. Our police and fire department serves our community with professionalism and integrity and makes our hometown a safe place to thrive. The city of Apopka greatly values its local businesses. The Chamber of Commerce is at the forefront of bridging the gap between local businesses and the community. We are the Mustangs here at Okaiva High School. We excel in FFA, culinary, and AFGRTC. Over here, we believe in quality over quantity. Yeah, 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 Jeremy. But over here at Apopka High School, we excel in sports, academics, and fine arts. Go Big Blue! <laughs> Apopka, also known as a potato eating place, has rich history. This history spans from our indigenous roots to the shores of Lake Apopka. Enjoy great music at our Saturday Sounds or organic vegetables at our farmer's market. Apopka has a lot of amazing events and activities for all ages. 
How can our youth be a part of the community of Poplar? Well, they can participate in many community service events throughout the year, while also being involved in our summer jobs program and youth council. Recreational sports are an integral part of life here in Apopka. Kids of all ages can enjoy sports like soccer, football, basketball, and baseball. The new outdoor exercise equipment is also pretty cool. One of the best parts about living in Apopka is its small town appeal. Whether you're riding a bike down a tree-lined street or enjoying a walk in one of our parks, Apopka offers something quite unique. Apopka is the indoor foliage capital of the world. Natural springs, wildlife, it's pretty serene here. And last but certainly not least, our favorite thing about Apopka is the people! Anybody want to come forward and just kind of tell us about your experience and what you what you enjoyed and what what's most memorable? Come on, not everybody. <laughs> <laughs> come on, come on. <laughs> come on, go to the mic, please, sir. Uh, my name is Rogerns Jackson. I attend Wakaba. Well, I used to speak attend. up. Speak up. My name is Rogerns Jackson. I used to attend Wakaba High School. I think uh, the most uh, memorable aspect is just learning about uh, the council as a whole and what it means to be a part of APACA and like integrating uh, the, the history behind APACA because a lot of times uh, many people didn't know the history. So through this program and uh, process, I learned so much about APACA and I like grew a love for it. I used to think it was like this boring place, but then I grew to that's find awesome. that it has so much things to offer. So I think that's like, uh, Thing, something I learned about Paco that I truly um, found through this program. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, all right. Anybody else? Um, I'm John Latimer, graduate from Apopka High School. Uh, my favorite thing I would say is learning about everything in Apopka and what you all do as a whole for us behind the scenes. I know everything might not be publicized, but you all do a lot for us. And then Ms. Dr. Jackson, our sponsor, she knows she's not only our sponsor, she is also a mentor for us as well, just guiding us through things in life and making us be a part of the city as well. So thank her for that as well. That's awesome. awesome. Okay, awesome. All right. Anybody else? Well, thank you. Thank Dr. Jackson for, for a great program, and uh, we continue to move forward and, and continue to have these programs and, and look forward to a, a new fresh crop of uh, – juniors and seniors next year. So thank you. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. I'm, I'm here to introduce Emily Hanna, one of my colleagues that I met through Metro Plan. She's the, the executive director of uh, Bike Walk Central Florida, and today she's going to talk a little bit about the Best Foot Forward um, pedestrian safety program and some other aspects about the programs that she um, oversees. I don't want to take too much from her, but I did want to make a connection between what she's doing and what she's talking to us about and our relationship with Metro Plan. And as part of that relationship, she is participating with the next agenda item, which is the um, Metro plan study for the Rock Springs Road Welch area, and she's going to be advising us on that. So, oh, Emily, awesome. Thank you, Pam. Appreciate that. Good afternoon, Mayor and Commission. My name is Emily Hanna. I'm the Executive Director of Bike Walk Central Florida, and today I'm here to talk to you about one of our programs, Best Foot Forward. But before I begin, I have to really tell you why I'm here, and it's not a great thing, and it's not a, it's not a good reason. Unfortunately, I'm here today because Central Florida is one of the most dangerous places for people to walk and bike. 
Um, historically, since 2009, we've ranked number one or in the top five of a national study called Dangerous by Design. And unfortunately, that's not a place that Orlando and Central Florida wants to be number one at, right? So we need to move the needle, and that's what Bike Walk and the Best Foot Forward program are here to do. But why are we so dangerous, and why are we number one? Well, part of that has to do with us as drivers. We're often distracted nowadays with technology and signage and the kids fighting in the back seat. We often don't necessarily pay attention to um, what's around us as we drive. We often carelessly walk as well. You've noticed as, as you as a pedestrian, oftentimes <coughs> you'll follow the path of least resistance and walk from 1A to point B as fast as you can in a, as, you know, a straight line. Uh, we don't build places for people to walk. We often build places to drive. And obviously that leads into my third point, which is careless design. We've taken the last 50 years and have really designed our communities for the vehicle and not for the people that truly live in those neighborhoods. And so we'd like to kind of change that, and that's what we're doing today with Bike Walk Central Florida. So as I stated before, that is the nonprofit advocacy organization that administers the Best Foot Forward program on behalf of its coalition partners and is funded primarily through Metro Plan Orlando. But we do have another uh, advocacy tool. It's called Bike Five Cities. This is an annual uh, bicycle ride that we host along trails and safe streets throughout five cities in central Florida to really showcase where people can comfortably get out in their community on foot or on bike and explore new areas and new places. So we really needed a cohesive pedestrian safety message when that second Dangerous by Design report came out in 2011. Um, and so the Orlando region, Metro Plain Orlando, the city of Orlando and Orange County put their heads together and decided we needed to do something about this. And they formed the Best Foot Forward po uh, Pedestrian Safety Coalition in 2012. That coalition expanded into Osceola County in 2017 and then in Seminole County in 2019. And to date, we are one of the largest pedestrian safety coalitions in the country. And we do this by reviewing our, um, our roadways and how we educate drivers on the driver yield law and pedestrian safety through really a 4E approach. And this is through uh, NHTSA's high visibility enforcement um, kind of best practices guide. And that 4E approach is through education, engineering, enforcement, and evaluation. And I'll kind of go through that in a little detail. So we evaluate the crosswalks by collecting driver yield rate data. So essentially, we have a data collector cross the street upwards of 60 times throughout one day at different times of the day. And depending on if the driver yields to that pedestrian as they enter the crosswalk, or if they don't, that's how we collect our yield rates. Um, and so you can see here Woodbury Road and Mallory Circle, eight cars out of 100 yielded to a pedestrian at that location. So how do we have pedestrians, how do we tell pedestrians that it's safe to cross the road at that location when only eight vehicles are really yielding to them? While we do this data collection, we look at the um, makeup of the intersections, the crosswalks themselves. We identify opportunities to work with our engineering, our public works partners, to do some striping or some low-cost engineering improvements like signage or um, other countermeasures that we now have access to, these new tools that we're discovering. So we try to um, work with our public works departments to put those in place and then Go back and collect data. Is that working, right? We're constantly measuring whether or not we're successful. Um, but we feel like we are. Through the uh, engineering and education and enforcement, we were able to increase the driver yield rate at a crosswalk um, at Edgewater Drive and Shady Lane. I like this example because Edgewater Drive was already a complete street when it entered into the Best Foot Forward program. And the yield rate was only 25 24% even with on-street parking, even with narrower lanes. So it takes education and it takes enforcement to also drive that message home. And so with that consistent messaging and enforcement, we were able to increase the driver yield rate at Shady Lane. And so we do this across the three-county region. I, I told you a little bit about our partners a minute ago. But we monitor upwards of 60 crosswalks a year, collect data on them, and work with our partners to identify those low-cost engineering solutions. And then, of course, work with the law enforcement to enforce some of those. I'd like to, if possible, share this video with you. This is an operation that was held several years ago in Orlando, but I think does a really great job of showing how our law enforcement partners are a huge part of this program. 
on. So let me see if I can play this real quick. School started and some counties in Orange County kids will head back to school on Monday. For cops, it's the perfect time to make a point about crosswalks and the obligation drivers have okay. when people are crossing the street legally in a crosswalk. West Tuesday, McDaniel was on hand as a slew of drivers found out the hard way. The guy in the blue shirt's a cop trying to make a point. So the Honda northbound left lane. Oh my God. By trying to safely cross the street. Southbound black Kia four door right lane. He ended up dodging cars. You didn't see him? He was pretty obvious. Uh -oh. Operation Best Foot Forward been in place for a few months. Over 1,600 warnings have been given out to people who did not stop with a person legally in the crosswalk. This was day one for actual tickets. The way the law reads, once the pedestrian enters the crosswalk, People coming from either direction are obligated to stop, let him cross safely. If they don't stop, they get a $164 reminder. It's your obligation to stop for that pedestrian as long as he's inside that crosswalk. This driver thought without flashing lights or a traffic signal, the walker was in the wrong. First time you ever ask, man, I flipped it before you. But a few drivers did pay attention, slowing, even stopping. We need everybody to be on their best behavior and paying attention for the uh, children that will be out and about. Even in full uniform, Sergeant Gogolis had people whiz right on by. We don't want them to give a gas and see if they can beat the pedestrian. We want them to slow down and be able to stop in time to let the pedestrian safely cross. Southbound, blue Honda SUV, southbound, right lane, didn't even slow down. In an hour at only two spots, cops wrote 64 tickets. With more cops available, they felt they could have written 100. Orlando, Orange County, Dave McDaniel, West Two News. <clears throat> So a pretty impactful video, right? It shows really the, the true need for having our law enforcement partners involved with the program, but also why education is such a key piece to that. Um, we feel that if uh, with every driver pulled over and receiving a warning and or a ticket, they angrily tell 15 of their friends. So we feel like that's a really good way of sharing our message as well. Um, but we really partner with our media. Um, and that's our, our, our biggest takeaway with our law enforcement operations because we do these in a region-wide effort. So we partner, we have uh, Osceola County, Orange County, City of Orlando, and Seminole doing it all within the same week, usually within the same few days. And the media loves to get a hold of that story and talk about how we're improving these streets for pedestrian safety. And so because of that, we're able to leverage the wonderful news coverage of these events and again, continue to share that message because it's all about education. I don't want to pull people over, I want to educate them, right? Sometimes you got to do both. But we also do that through social media. Um, so we share our partners' updates, what they're doing, events, projects that you have what you're working on. And also, when we're out in the community, we share that message as well. We have quite a following on social media, um, and so that's a, a platform we use quite often to continue our message. And so to date, the program's been around uh, since 2012 was when it launched. So I like to say we've educated roughly 10,000 drivers um, and have done um, close to 500 enforcement details where we've actually done crosswalk enforcements. Um, in the program total, we've monitored close to 200 crosswalks. We've completed 606 presentations and events uh, educating on pedestrian safety. Um, the earned media value of 5.8 million is what we would pay for advertisement space that the media has provided us for free by um, showcasing our program and what we do in the community. And then our total social media impressions are um, a mere 1.5 million eyeballs. So that's a, a good reach. And so how do you get involved? How do you become a part of the Best Foot Forward program? Well, you start by participating um, and invite us to come speak to your Rotary Clubs, your HOAs, your community groups. Let us come to your events and share our message about pedestrian and bicycle safety. And then support projects and developments that encourage walking and biking. Um, when you're reviewing projects then in the planning stages, make sure that there's a pedestrian connection from the sidewalk to the beginning of the building, right? Well, oftentimes, that's, that's something that we miss. Are the sidewalks wide enough? Um, is there enough street trees? Are there enough amenities to support the pedestrian needing to walk or bike to their, their destination? And ultimately, support complete streets projects. Um, support policies that um, have those type of elements in place and support the, the program and infrastructure that's necessary to get people out moving in their community. And then tell your colleagues and friends about our message. Obviously, we want you to tell your friends, I watched a really scary video of an officer almost getting hit by a car. You know, those types of messaging and remembering those moments are really what drive home this, this issue. 
and then turn that car trip into a walking or bike trip. So uh, literally, get your best foot forward and get out there and walk to a destination. Experience what it's like from a pedestrian's point of view. I can tell you probably it's not going to be that enjoyable, but you can at least look at it from the lens of a pedestrian and know how you, as the commission, can address those issues from a policy and development standpoint. And thank you for ultimately having me here today to come talk to you about pedestrian safety, about Bike Walk Central Florida, and of course, the Best Foot Forward program. Uh, I will be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Any questions? Is, is that a program that you would like to bring to APOPCA? Absolutely. Um, because that's certainly a program that I would certainly embrace because we have so many schools that are at busy intersections. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and you're right, because I, I do use the streets. I do park my car and use the streets. And we have one particular uh, four corners that uh, you literally take your life into your hands when you want to cross. So it's, it's something that I particularly would definitely welcome, a program that we can start uh, at least advancing and promoting uh, pedestrian safety. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's great to bring awareness to it. And I was just curious with the, the data, do we have a higher number in the around the theme park region, or is it pretty much even across the board? Um, it's pretty even across the board. Well, I wouldn't say even. There are certain counties and cities that have higher um, pedestrian injuries and fatalities than others. It has a lot to do with um, the speed of the facility, the roadway itself, and the number of lanes of the roadway, and then what the, the context is around that roadway. Um, so if you've got, for example, if you've got an apartment complex on one side and a grocery store on the other, and there's no place for people to cross, you're going to have natural pedestrian crossings at that, inter at that location. Um, and so we really need to understand the, the differences between that and provide that connection for them, right? So they don't have to go down to the nearest crosswalk cross and, and cross again. Um, so being looking at those types of things is incredibly critical, absolutely. And is that broken down also by cities as well or just county regions? So right now it's um, cities as well, but some cities are not a part of the program. So we only monitor and collect data for those that are a part of the program. Uh, the county tends to focus on unincorporated areas of the county, specifically in Orange County. There's a lot of unincorporated that they want to monitor. Um, and so they, they really expect the cities that if they want to participate, then they, they will look at their own jurisdictions that well, way. Apopka is number one, but we don't want to be there. So uh, <laughs> hopefully we can be number one in safety concerning those things so I think it's great that's my goal thank you mr. Smith uh, yes uh, likewise it's something that I would support and would love to see come to the city of Apopka to mm -hmm. educate our residents as well and I guess my other question is um, once you identify that it is a dangerous uh, intersection for pe pedestrians do you provide the signage that's necessary in order to change those habits we don't. We work with your public works departments because nobody knows them better than the, the guys on the streets, right? Your public works, your maintenance crews, they know the little blips in the sidewalk. They know what signs need to be replaced. So we just work through them and let them know and make those recommendations. Um, we will, if there's a funding issue, we will work to try to find the funding, whether or not it's grant supported or through other dollars elsewhere. But we really put, we really try to be the um, extension of staff, if you will, um, with that expertise in bike ped safety. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Mr. Becker? Yeah, um, <clears throat> so it's interesting. Here in Apoc, obviously when you go to your cities, you have to understand what the behaviors are in, in the city that you go to. And I would venture to guess that, and you use the terminology dilemma zones on your intersections, I would venture to guess that a good portion of our traffic fa or pedestrian fatalities due to traffic or vehicular reasons <clears throat> happen outside of that zone because people just aren't using the formal crosswalks that we have here in Apopka. Right. So how do you assess the natural behaviors of people knowing that that's the issue, right? The pedestrians are gonna take the path of least resistance and it may not be through a crosswalk. And Absolutely. so the data may be flawed. How do you address kind of going into a city and understanding where people are actually going across. I mean, we case in point, the lead-in on your presentation shows that beautiful crosswalk bridge that mm -hmm. goes over 441. Mm -hmm. I would venture to guess maybe 10% of the people that cross the street actually use that. Um, so it's understanding our behaviors too and educating us on how to fix those as well. Absolutely. Because some of that may come into the enforcement side of things, not necessarily engineering. Very, very true. Yeah. 
Um, one of the things we look at is basically the facilities throughout the community. What are the roadways, right? What do they look like? How big are they? How fast do they move traffic? What type of traffic do they move? Are they a truck route? Um, do they, are they a neighborhood street? There's different contexts for every classification of roadway. So we come in and we really look at that. Then we look at the data. We look at where people are going. Where, where are some points of interest and destinations? Is there an apartment complex and a grocery store? Or one of the things that I didn't realize on a, a street in downtown Orlando, there was a bar and then there was a cash advance and there was some fatalities that were occurring at three <laughs> o'clock in the morning between these two destinations. We couldn't put the two and two together and we finally got some data to realize that's probably why. So maybe we need to light a crosswalk for someone to want to go across the street. So we look at those types of factors and that takes time. We're not going to be able to come in and give you these recommendations right away. We're going to have to assess things and talk with your staff. You know, you and your staff know more about your community than I do coming in. But what I can tell you is what works elsewhere based on the roadway, based on the context, what's around that roadway, and what are some other factors, trip generators? Is it the trail, right? How does that impact how people move around the community? And then how to leverage the assets that you have to build upon that momentum. You have a beautiful trail through the heart of your downtown. How do we get people to use that to go to the destinations here in Apopka instead of turning around before they get to the bridge, right? Because they don't want to go over that bridge. So we try to look at those types of factors and ask the community. And that's why going out and doing the community outreach and being at the events is a big part of the, the boots on the ground that we bring to, to your staff, as I said, as an extension of your staff, because we hear about those comments. So it's a little bit multifaceted. And um, there's also projects that you guys are working on that we like to be involved in to help advance pedestrian and bicycle safety. Ultimately, there is a, um, a give and take with vehicle, moving vehicles through your community. That still is the primary you know, mode of transportation along with transit. So we have to consider how we move everybody around. Um, but I ultimately advocate for the peds and the bikes. <laughs> so. mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Emily. I, I know that um, I think the cost, 4500 does that sound right? For it's $5,000 $5, a year, yep. OK, for the city of Apopka, so we can Pam, we might want to look at putting that in the budget, sounds like, from the commissioner's point of view. But I'll give you my, my, um, my experience with, with the group. We went out, I was in Pine Hills when I was commissioner, mm -hmm. and we were on Pine Hills Road, and we had a, you know, a plain, closed, plain closed officer making the trip across Pine Hills Road. And it was, it was really disturbing how few people stopped. And I'll never forget that one of the last ones that they ticketed, a lady in a minivan, and not only did she not stop for the guy in the crosswalk, she honked her horn and was screaming at him all kind of names. You know, he was, you know, get out of the road. You know, what's wrong with you? So it, it's a, it's obviously we've got pedestrians that, that are doing the wrong thing, and we've got drivers doing the wrong thing, and it's it's the education which they bring to the table that, mm -hmm. and I've been very impressed as as a county commissioner, and and uh, I think it's a great organization that can help us kind of. As we know, we've had some some incidents here in the last, you know, couple of years that we need to try to address, and I think they'll be a good good partner with us to, to make those things happen. So, Emily, thank you, thank you so much for Absolutely. coming. Absolutely, thank you, you for bet. having me, and you have a great you. rest of your day. Thank mm -hmm. you. Okay, Pam, are you back up for? We've been trying to fix the intersection of Rock Springs Road and Welch since I worked for the city, and that's been <laughs> four years, and I think it extended before that. It's just an incredibly large fix. It, it extends well beyond the intersection. And so talking with our partners at Metro Plan and our partners at Orange County, because it's half their problem, um, Metro Plan stepped up and is funding a study that we're doing. And it's, it's a complete street study, and it also incorporates the West Orange Trail, so that's a bonus. Um, but the best part is, is Metro Plan gave us their A-team. Our project manager for Metro Plan is Laura Baugh, and, and, and then their <coughs> consultant project manager is Amy Sermons. They're gonna come up and do a presentation. But also on the Metro Plan team is Taylor Lawrence. She's new to Metro Plan, but very talented. And this is all compliments of Nick Lepp, who is the director of transportation um, at Metro Plan. And I just want to reiterate that this is a partnership with Orange County as well. 
and my counterpart at Orange County is Brian Sanders. I, I think some of y'all know he's, him. Yeah, he's here. And I don't do anything without consulting Brian and vice versa. <laughs> so this is going to be an excellent project. <clears throat> They're going to come up and, and um, show you where we are now and where we're taking the project. Good afternoon, Mayor Nelson, commissioners. Thank you for your time today. So since Pam already introduced us, I will just say that we're very excited to be working on this project, kicked off in March of this year. Amy's gonna do the presentation and I'll be up here to answer any questions we have. I think as we get into the presentation, you'll see how many elements of bicycle and pedestrian safety <laughs> there are in these two projects. And so we're really excited to have Amy on, on board to help out our team as we move forward. Again, I'm Amy Sermons with VHB, and thank you for having us here today. As Laura mentioned, we started in March, so we are um, talking with folks to get some information um, about the projects. And like Pam also mentioned, we have two projects we're talking about, the Rock Springs Road as well as the West Orange Trail Extension. We'll go over the study schedule and then open it up for any questions you have. So starting with the Rock Springs Road study, um, the overview of the project, we're looking at the intersection from Welch Road as well as a complete streets project from Welch Road to Luster Road. Um, Sandpiper Street is another portion of the study where we're looking at the portion from Lake Avenue to Usler Road, as well as Sandpiper Street at the, and the Park Avenue intersection. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. So the purpose of this part of the project um, is to establish a safe and efficient access management plan for the study corridor, or really look at more of a complete streets and determine those intersection improvements for Rock Springs Road at Welch Road. And again, we've been working with Emily, so we're gonna incorporate our um, bicycle pedestrian uh, look into the project as well. At Sandpiper Street, uh, we're looking at kind of two things. We're looking at the intersection of Sandpiper Street and, and Park Avenue. Currently, it's a skewed intersection, so we're gonna look at realigning so that road lines up at Park Avenue. And we're also gonna look at adding sidewalk along Sandpiper Street. Um, currently, there's sidewalk on the south side when you look west of, um, of Park Avenue, but nothing on the north side, and then it's the opposite on the east side. So we'll look at filling those gaps of sidewalks. Now, looking at the West Orange Trail Extension Study, um, our limits run kind of all over the place, but we'll look at <laughs> looking at Rock Springs Road. We're going to start where the trail currently ends at Lester Road and carry all the way up to Kelly Park Road. That's going to tie into the planned um, Wakaiva Trail Extension. And then we're also looking at some spurs. So we're looking down Welch Road from Rock Springs to connect over to the Wakaiva Springs uh, Park entrance. In addition, we're looking down Ponkin Road from Rock Springs to connect over to the elementary and middle schools. So this project has been in the Orange County Trails Master Plan as a proposed project for quite some time. The purpose is obviously to extend the West Orange Trail from its existing terminus at Lester Road and connect up to that Wakaiva Trail that is planned to be built at some point. Um, also, as I mentioned, to tie down Welch Road and provide connection to the Wakaiva River Blueway Trail. Down Ponkin Road, we want to provide that connection not only to the elementary and middle schools, but also to the Popka City, City Athletic Complex. So looking at, again, we're doing these two studies concurrently. Um, whenever we present, we'll talk about both projects. Um, our schedule, like we said, we started in March. Um, we're currently in the phase of getting existing information and looking at our future conditions assessment. That's part of why we're talking to several agencies. Um, this, as Emily mentioned, is you know the city, you know your area. So we want to gain information from the city and the county to build on our existing conditions. Um, after that, in September of this year, we'll start defining our alternatives that we're going to look at. And then ultimately, around September of next year, we'll select those alternatives to move forward. Um, with the next step being designed to move that into the design phase. Um, we do have some public engagement opportunities, which I'll talk a little bit more about in the next stage. Next slide, sorry. Um, we're here, we're doing agency presentations. We've had our uh, kickoff presentation to you guys today. Um, we will continue to come back to the council and present our findings as we move forward through the project. We are also planning to have two public meetings. Uh, one will be once we have those alternatives defined, the plan right now is to hold that in January of 2022. And then we'll take that information and help revi refine our different corridor alternatives, come back to the public with our recommended alternative around September of next year. 
We also plan to uh, solicit information through project newsletters and provide information about the projects at three <coughs> different points throughout the schedule. And then we have planned for several <coughs> coordination meetings uh, and small group meetings. So if we need to talk to HOAs, business owners, um, whatnot, we have that in our scope to talk to people to get the information we need to build our alternatives. We also have an interactive website, which is just up and running, and it looks, uh, MetroPlan puts it together. It looks great. We, we currently have a survey out there to get information, and very soon we're also going to have an online comment uh, form where people can go in and uh, pick, an, uh, pick a location on a map and put their comments about each project. We'll also be using extensively email blasts, so um, we'll use all of our avenues to get information out about the projects um, uh, through emails as well as surveys. So that was very short and sweet. Um, again, we're early in the project, but here's uh, Laura's information and my information. And if you have any questions. Any questions, please, Rebecca? <clears throat> yeah, so on your Gantt chart you had, it would be the end of 2022 before anything's even on paper solidified. What does that do in terms of actual execution of what needs to happen? So following the, the study phase, there would need to be a design phase, which is typically um, a couple years, it's really going to depend on the funding, you know, if the funding is programmed. Um, I believe everything, the intent right now is everything that we do should be within existing right-of-way. So I said that's going to help move things through quicker. Um, beyond that, unless Laura Okay. So, um, really so tagging on another two years at the end of what's on, on there. And then uh, you led into my, my second and only other question was, <clears throat> how does Metro plan... You know, if there's one bucket of money, how do you prioritize um, areas of need? Because there's, you know, that could potentially impact the timeline as well, correct? Absolutely. And actually, um, we have recently revamped our prioritization process. And so um, we'll see what, what alternatives come out as a recommended alternative for this project. And it'll get sort of lumped in with all of the other prioritized projects. And um, it'll get prioritized. As yeah, it's, it's an interesting segue from the last conversation because that Rock Springs area from Welch to Leicester, mm -hmm. you know, there's high volume of uh, pedestrian walking across right there by the McDonald's and uh, Bubble Loo's Barbecue going across the street there. So outside of a, a formalized crosswalk and stuff like that. And plus, you know, just vehicular traffic outside of pedestrians in that area is just, it's madness. It's, so, yes, I mean, that's, we, we, yeah. we did our, our field review about a month ago, and yeah, we, we noticed a lot of that activity and already talking about potentially looking into some midmore crossings, yeah. and we'll see what sort of So just make sure it stays did, prioritized for us. Did you try us. to cross <laughs> that street from, we, we, uh, <laughs> from Welch to Rock Springs Road? Like, we did. It, it's not a, a wide street, but... Um, it was, yeah, it was an experience, yes. It was an experience. <laughs> Mr. Smith? I'm good. <clears throat> I'm tremendous on the study on Sandpiper. I've lived there since 97, and my daughter totaled a car at uh, that intersection and thankfully walked away. Um, we had about seven, at least seven severe accidents in our front yard, and that was really fixed by the working together with the county and the city on that four-way stop. That's been a tremendous success and has really changed the behavior there. Uh, that intersection, there is a cutaway for wheelchair access, but it's down from the actual intersection. I walk my dogs every day across there, and sometimes that's a little challenge because that's not clear. So that would be nice to just get a, a clear crosswalk and wear there, and I think that'll help as well. So thank you for working there. It is kind of a relief for the Welch problem, and so a lot of traffic goes there, and of course, in the evening, of course, when everyone's coming home from work, that backs up. So that realignment will be a, a big help. It also helps already with the uh, issues at Welch. So they'll work tandem, and I'm, I'm glad that focus is included there. And uh, yes, as Commissioner Becker said, the sooner the better on those things. So thank you for focusing on that and advocate for us here, because that's a real important intersection there at Welch. Absolutely. Happy to. Thank you. Commissioner yeah, I'm Blaskis. Kind of, I'm looking forward to the, the study, although I you know, would like to have had it yesterday. Um, but that was actually a, a a big discussion that I actually had with our chief administrator just recently, um, because these studies are long term. So my concern is, what can we do now that will kind of just put a bandaid in the area? And uh, of course, we had discussed that, and that's something that will be coming up, and especially uh, striping in the streets, uh, uh, striping for pedestrian. 
because that's visible. That's something that will at least make drivers and pedestrians realize it's safe to cross. And when the drivers see a pedestrian crosswalk, they realize pedestrians are crossing at that intersection. So, um, you know, I'm, I, I wish we can do this a lot sooner, but um, just the fact that you are even, you know, starting this is, I have to say that I'm, I'm happy. We're excited to be working on it, and I will say that Pam and Brian are both advocating hard for this yeah. study, so yeah. it's a top priority for us. And, uh, <laughs> and Pam, how Pam Rich, Richmond is, is excellent. I mean, she's a big advocate for pedestrian transportation, and she tries to find a, a, a medium where we can all work together, so I appreciate it. The, the one thing we did ask them, you know, we were we our initial kickoff meeting is to take a look at, wait on the traffic studies until after the new Publics opens because we're not we're afraid that it will traffic patterns might change. People that live mm -hmm. on the west side of Leicester might go that direction for their groceries versus coming back to Rock Springs Road. So I said we want to wait till September when schools back in 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 you know in force and the new Publix opens. I think the end of July. So then so they said yeah we'll hold up and and wait till those get completed because it could change those those traffic patterns. Mm -hmm. So thank you, ladies, thank you. and I'd like to thank Orange County for for your help. Yes. We appreciate appreciate it. Metro Plan, thank you. Thank you. All right. Okay. Oh, public comment, Susan. Um, Me okay. Mayor, can we can I on agenda review? Can we go yeah. back to agenda review real quick? Sure. So item. If, um, under public hearing, resolution 2021-28, which is actually item number 11. Um, staff would like to request that we move that item to the beginning of the resolutions because the resolutions from 21-22 to 21-29 are all related to the CDBG um, program. So we'd ask that if we could, staff would ask to have 20-28 moved to, the, to um, the beginning of the resolutions. Okay. So move okay. that to like move that to number four. Okay, Th three and a half. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So eleven would be four. Correct. Okay. And then this starts with five. Okay. All right. So no public hearing, no public comments. All right. Consent agenda. Does anybody need to pull any of the items off the consent agenda? If not, look for a motion to approve as. Red. So moved. We've got a motion by Commissioner Banks. Second. Second by Commissioner Smith. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Next up, major development plan, the Cote property. Who's got that? G. Did we approve the council meeting? The minutes? Good afternoon, Jean Sanchez with the Planning and Zoning Division. This is a request to approve the Coke Property Subdivision Major Development Plan. The property is located east of State Road 429, south of Peterson Road, and west of Grand Avon Parkway, approximately 41.85 acres. Aerial of the property shows it's currently vacant, surrounded by residential and agricultural facilities. The Coke Property Subdivision Major Development Plan proposes a development 58 single-family detached homes and 142 townhome units. Based on the zoning district, the applicant is required to provide 8.32 acres of open space. The major development plan reserves a total of 13.06 acres for open space and recreation. On-site amenities include a pool and cabana. There's an existing 11-foot wide trail along Grand Avian Parkway as part of the newly constructed boulevard. The minimum typical lot width for the single family detached units is 70 feet and 20 feet for the townhomes. The minimum living area for a townhome unit is 1250 square feet and 1500 square feet for a single family detached residence. The project will have access on the roadway network from two locations on Grand Avian Parkway. The applicant plans to cut the median in two, two locations. The northernmost will primarily serve the single family residences and the southern modes will primarily serve the townhomes, but there's internal connectivity that allows access to both entrances. 
The DRC and the Planning Commission recommend approval of the Coke Property Subdivision Major Development Plan. The recommended motion is to approve the Coke Property Major Development Plan. Staff and applicant are available for questions. Okay. Any questions for Gene? Becker? Yeah, um, so within the lead in packet, the second paragraph under access and transportation um, uh, says project impacts do not create new deficiencies to the roadway network. However, the developer has agreed to participate in an agreement with the city to make improvements to King Street and Peterson Street. So I'm just understand, I want to understand the details behind that and the timing. <clears throat> They're not creating any deficiencies. There are deficiencies that exist already. And if we had to wait on us to make those fixes, it would take several years. They're partnering with the, the development to the north. What's the name of that project? The, the, there is a directly north on Peterson Road. There's another industrial project. And they're going to combine their resources. They're going to, instead of paying their impact fees directly to the city, they're going to get impact fee credits for fixing Peterson Road and King Street. They can do it faster than I can, and they can do it a lot cheaper. If I had to do it, um, I would have to advertise, and it would definitely cost me more money and, and more time. Okay, so I, I get that, So, but I am I want the outcome. So when do I get the outcome? Because right now, Peterson and King have crumbling shoulders. There's no paint or striping on those streets. So knowing that we're sticking this above Avian Point in terms of that volume, what are the assurances that we have that Peterson and King are going to get done in the short term versus long term? Because that, that road, safety-wise, would not be suitable for the, that much volume that's coming from those. And, and, and they both acknowledge that, and, and the road construction is going to go on when they're doing their infrastructure um, uh, for their sites too. I don't expect that they'll be completely finished before the road's finished. In fact, I think that they'll start working on the road. I'm just waiting right now that the agreement's being drafted and in some way it's going to be tied to their COs. That, you know, something has to be under construction. Is this the last time that we'll see this business or will we have another opportunity to talk through that? The agreement, you'll see the agreement okay. when it's ready. And then the only other part, because this is directly impacting Peterson and King, but ultimately, when you get out on Orange, that Lake View and Lake Heinegger intersection, so you have all this that's going on here, you're getting more development that's going on further down Binion that's in the mix. There's going to be a lot of traffic coming in there. So I, I was just wondering, in terms of that intersection, um, will that be on budget to do a study? We're going to fix it to the best of our ability on the um, King Street side, Orange is a county road, and I have yet to get them to commit to even acknowledging that there's a problem. Um, so we're going to fix it as, as best as we can with the impact fee money that we're, that we're collecting. Everything right now in that area, all the impact fee money that's coming in is going to fix those roads. And then we have a little problem up at Orange and um, uh, uh, 441 that needs to be fixed as soon as possible too. Okay, so just to clarify, once once we uh, transact on this business, we'll have another opportunity to see what the final agreement is in terms of that Absolutely. road construction. You'll have to approve the agreement. Okay. Commissioner Smith. Commissioner Price. So that's exactly the paragraph that I had highlighted and similar question on that was 1,700 daily trips, roughly. It's again, and the extra development that's already in the works. We're going to see that becoming a bottleneck there. So, again, as we can continue to advocate to our uh, Orange County, did they leave, uh, to our counterpart there, that uh, we can really address that before it becomes the issue. They're, they're and, going to bring uh, the road up to city standards, mm -hmm. and they're going to fix the intersection of King and Peterson to make it safer yeah. and um, add turn lanes at Orange and uh, King Street. You know, we have to work with what we have, mm -hmm. and definitely it will, um, it will be able to handle the traffic. The road condition is really poor, to your point, yep. and they're going to fix that. And again, to work together, I'm pleased that uh, the developers are working together with us on that. I want to make sure that we get what needs to be in place before we have all that traffic. Mr. Velasquez? Nope. A lot of other questions. Okay. All right. Thank you. 
All right, anybody from the public wish to speak on this matter? Okay, if not, we'll close the public hearing and look for a motion to approve the major development plan for the Cope property. So moved. Got a motion by Commissioner Smith. Recall during the last city council meeting held on Wednesday, March 19th, um, the ratification of the bid protest period was authorized to allow for a firm to submit beyond the initial 72 hours provided in our purchasing policy. No formal bid protests were submitted as of the deadline on Friday, May 21st, 2021. Uh, so with that, staff is recommending approval to negotiate rates with the highest scored firm, which was Infrastructure Management Services, LLC, in accordance with Florida Statute 287.055. Any questions for Edward? The only question I would have, and not necessarily around uh, the nuts and bolts of the contract, but <clears throat> in terms of staff, uh, can we get something out of this so that we don't have to go out for this type of engagement in the future, meaning we, we glean some sort of expertise from how to grade our own pavement and be able to assess it and prioritize it ourselves? I because adding the, this just adds time to the timeline. Right. We can look into that. I don't know that we have any expert. We don't have an expert on staff that these are experts that actually will test the road surface, the underneath the road. Um, the conditions of the road, but that's something we could we can look at into the future is, is seeing if there's somebody on our staff that can do this. But currently, as we sit right now, we don't have anyone that can actually assess these roads for their conditions. Um, and I think it's going to give us, I think, 10 years or so. I mean, I, I don't, yeah, obviously, I think, we don't want to do it every yeah, three years, but yeah, I, think, I think, you know, if based yeah. on, they'll because they'll, they take into account the traffic, like if it's more industrial traffic, you know, bigger, you know, big 18-wheelers, then they would, they would grade that differently than a, than a, you know, a neighborhood road as far as when it would need to be replaced. So, I, I mean, I mean, if we're not getting 10 years out of it, then we, we've got the wrong, we've got right. the wrong no, group. Exactly. <laughs> so we've never had anything like this. So I think this yeah. is like, this is building, kind of builds the foundation. This gives us that list of all of our roads and the conditions that they're in so that we can evaluate when we come to budget time with the dollars that we do have um, based on the, the um, conditions of them and, and the maintenance of them. And I think if I'm not mistaken, they also are going to provide there are certain, when they rank them or whatever, there's also a way where they can tell us which ones, you know, can maybe take a different type of treatment rather than a complete resurface. So I think that's what some of the, the deliverables that we get as well. But the good thing about this is we'll have an, a, list, a list of all the assessed, an assessment of all the roads, the city-owned roads that, we'll, that we can use going forward. So how long would that study take? The last I heard, they said that it would take about three to four months so again, we have to negotiate with them now um, for the contract, and then as soon as we get that completed, and we're trying to rush that as quickly as possible. We want to get them up and running. We'd like to have this so that when we get to budget at the end of the, this fiscal year, at budget time, we'll have this this assessment or this list to be able to use in our, in our budget process. So in the interim, if there are streets that need repaving or uh, special attention, will we at least uh, attend to that? while this study is being done? Yes, and um, Commissioner, to that point, I um, have worked, I've been working with um, public services, and we've got a couple that are really, really, if you remember, if you recall, we put some funding in the budget this, in the current year that we're in. We didn't have a lot of funding because we were gonna have the assessment done first, but if you recall, we did take some, some additional funding that we put there that we transferred from general fund dollars into the streets fund, and so there's a couple roads that Paul and his group in public services is looking into, we're getting, um, some quotes and, and stuff now for those roads, which are really, those are two of the worst roads that we have. So we're, and we're assuming those are gonna come out on the assessment as the top two. So we're looking to take care of those now with those dollars, and then we'll use this um, assessment going forward. I missed, what were the top two that you mentioned? Sorry. The what? what were the top two that you mentioned? Um, Yalders Road was one of them. That's okay. where we've been getting a lot of complaints on, and Yalders Road, and then uh, I think the second one was Second Street. There's a stretch of Second Street where we've had some issues. Or so those two are the ones that we've been getting a lot of calls with potholes and issues and problems that we're trying to address um, um, first. So that we, because we've been getting a lot of, of um, calls on those. And then we'll use the assessment going forward on how to evaluate which roads should come up in which years. And Second well, Street, is that the one behind, by OK Tower? Yeah. Yeah. OK. okay. <laughs> Mr. Bankson? Good. Good. Okay. And that would include a lot of the uh, developments that we have, like Rock Springs Ridge. Also, the roads we take care. We take yes, care of. Yes, it would be roads. any right any city maintained road or yeah. the ones that they would provide the assessment for. No private roads and no county roads. Okay. Or state roads. Or state roads. 
Okay. Anybody from the public wish to speak on this matter? If not, we we'll close the public hearing. Look for a motion to award contract for RFQ 2021-05 regarding the pavement condition assessment. So moved. Got a motion by Commissioner Bankson. Second. Second by Commissioner Velasquez. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Next up, reimbursement of legal fees. Michael. Good afternoon. Prior to beginning my presentation, I think I would I'd advise Commissioner Smith to uh, recuse himself from this matter. Just waiting for an extra announcement to just announce that you're recusing yourself. I am. Thank you. Okay. Matter before you is the uh, request for reimbursement of legal fees and costs for Commissioner Alexander Smith's complaint that was filed against him before the Florida Commission on Ethics. Approximately on June 22nd, a complaint was filed alleging certain wrongdoings on the part of uh, Commissioner Smith. The complaint was subsequently investigated by the Florida Commission of e on Ethics and last April, the commission um, ruled that there was no probable cause for each item in which there was an allegation of uh, wrongdoing on the part of Commissioner Smith. So therefore, the, um, a commissioner is entitled to reimbursement of their attorney's fees and costs in defending a commission on ethics charge if it's a, there's a two-pronged test that has to be met and evaluated by the council in order for the reimbursement to be approved. The two-pronged test states the one item to be, to be reviewed is that, sorry, now I just got sidetracked. One, the conduct complained of arose out of or was in connection with the performance of the officer's official duties. The second prong is that it was done while serving a public service. The allegations in the complaint were not necessarily clear, but it seemed to have um, surrounded a vote that was taken by this council in approving a uh, sponsorship uh, agreement with Advent Health. Um, and that was the only concrete um, aspect of the allegations that can appear to be some type of a public service. Um, secondly, that that action was done in the um, in the public service, as this was part of the, his actions, Commissioner Smith's actions are all related to his actions on this on the dais in voting on matters before the city. I have attached as part of the packet the conclusions of the Florida Commission on Ethics in finding that there was no probable cause to find any violations of those um, statutes that were alleged in the complaint. Therefore, um, I believe, and I would advise council that the um, the request for reimbursement meets the two-pronged test, that the conduct, the conduct complained of arose out of or was in connection with the performance of Commissioner Smith's official duties, and it was done while serving a public service. And therefore, we would request the approval of the reimbursement of, it, of his attorney's fees and costs in the amount of $3,076.76. So at this point, what will be needed is a motion to approve the costs and a vote on such a motion. Any questions? Anybody from public wish to speak on this matter? If not, we'll look for a motion to approve the reimbursement of legal fees and costs for Commissioner Alexander Smith. So moved. Second. Got a motion by Commissioner Bankson, second by Commissioner Becker. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? And one recused by Alexander Smith. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Mayor, I'd just like to add, I'm pleased with that outcome and yeah. uh, the level of service that this is providing to our community is just commendable. It's actually a, a great benefit to the city. So yeah. I really appreciate what they've done. And, and seeing it in action, it, it's a tremendous benefit. Yes. Well, thank you. All right. Ordinance number 2822. Ordinance number 2822. An ordinance of the city of Apopka, Florida, amending the future land use element of the Apopka Comprehensive Plan of the city of Apopka, changing the future land use designation from transitional to mixed use interchange for certain real property generally located east of State Road 429 and west of Plymouth Sorrento Road, owned by Klepsig Family Trust, Klepsig Dennis R. Life Estate, and Klepsig Joanne Life Estate, comprising 30.81 acres more or less 
providing for severability and for an effective date. Jean, any changes? Okay. Anybody from the public wish to speak on this matter? If not, we'll close the public hearing. Look for a motion to adopt ordinance number 2822. So, so moved. Got a motion by Commissioner Smith, second one, by Commissioner Velasquez. All those, one, oh, more, I'm sorry. one more comment on, on this one because oh, this sure. kind of bleeds into a couple other ones. Do we have, I know that um, uh, Chair Jacobs had written us a reply back. Do we have, did we create any formal uh, kind of ground rules around the school capacity issue on these things? I know that we, when we had our, our conversations before, we started kind of exploring some of these. You know, there was ones that were going to be two or three over capacity. This one's 15. One coming up, I think, is in the same <clears throat> same ballpark. Well, we, we did send a formal request for clarification to the uh, Orlando, uh, to the county. And uh, to my knowledge, I have not received a reply yet from the county with any type of direction or any type of reply to our, our request. At least to the legal department has not received anything back from Orange County. Okay. Uh, how long are we going to entertain there, a lack of response from OCPS? Because that doesn't preclude us from cr kind of creating some of our ground rules around this stuff. Correct. Correct. Right. Okay. Just putting it out there. I, I just think it's it would behoove us to make sure that we're not getting too far out of bounds here. Yeah. So. Well, I think in one of our previous council meetings, we requested a list of all the developments that we've already approved so we could look at the numbers of the overcrowding, but also in speaking with the uh, school board member, um, we have to be an exceedingly above the, the school capacity in order to warrant a new school. So yeah. by approving these, this kind of helps us to get the new school that we need. It's kind of where I've looked at it. Yeah, I mean, if you don't get, I was, I think, a high school, you have to get at least a thousand above capacity to get a new school, and yeah, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a quagmire. Yeah, I just, I think it's just going to be helpful if somehow we can get a summary of this, not piecemeal it on the capacity, but have more of a, this is what it is for this particular, but here's what we look off, look like overall. It, I mean, it, and I would agree. And I yeah. said, and then then you throw on <laughs> top of that is what the legislature does is you know they. They've kind of tried to um, <laughs> to uh, to make their their changes to what Orange County's doing, and so it's it's each year it's they're one up in each other. It's I wish we just get to a a place and kind of stay stay level. Anybody else? Any comments? If not, I'll look for a motion to approve Ordinance Number Twenty Eight Twenty Two. So moved. By motion by Commissioner Smith. I did second. Second by Commissioner Velasquez. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Next up, ordinance number 2840. Ordinance number 2840. An ordinance of the City of Apopka, Florida, changing the zoning from transitional to planned development for certain real property located north of West Orange Blossom Trail and west of State Road 429, comprising 73.93 acres more or less, and owned by Collier Benz Land Joint Venture LLC, providing for directions to the Community Development Director, severability, conflicts, and an effective date. Phil. Good afternoon, Mayor and City Commissioners. Phil Martinez, Planner 2 with the City's Planning Division. The applicant is proposing a rezoning from T, Transitional District, to PD, Planned Development District, along with a master plan. The subject area is approximately 73.93 acres and is highlighted in yellow. To the north are the Stanton Ridge, Vale View, and Plymouth Hills subdivisions. To the east is State Route 429. To the south is 441 Connector Road and Single Family Homes. And to the west is the Shiloh Missionary Baptist Church and Single Family Homes. The subject properties are Zone T, Transitional Districts, and comprise of a, a mixture of commercial future land use and HDR 15 or high density residential 15 future land use designations. The PD master plan proposes a mixed, mixed use development consisting of seven <coughs> development parcels. Proposed <coughs> uses include multifamily, townhomes, an assisted living facility, commercial retail, and a hotel. This development, the Floridian Town Center, is proposed to be accessed off of the connector road to the south and South Fork Road 
later intersecting into Plymouth's rental road to the east. In addition, planned future connections are proposed at the west and the north. The applicant proposes 11.22 acres of open space inside the gated apartment community on parcel four, located to the northeast, and 15.75 acres of open space are proposed outside of the gated apartment community throughout the planned development area. In addition, street trees are proposed adjacent to the Kiowa Avenue right-of-way, located to the northeast, and understory trees are pr proposed along South Fork Drive and Floridian Town Center Boulevard. These landscape standards are proposed to protect underground utilities, sidewalks, and the State Route 429 overpass located here at the east. The Development Review Committee and Planning Commission recommend approval of the proposed rezoning from T, Transitional District, to P, to PD, Plan Development District, and approval of the master plan. And the recommended motion for this afternoon is to accept the first reading of ordinance number 2840 and hold it over for second reading and adoption on June 16th, 2021. This concludes my presentation, and the applicant has a presentation. Thank you, Phil, for the introduction, and thank you, Commission, for the opportunity to come and present this for you today. Um, my name is Andrew McCown. I'm with GAI Consultants in Orlando, and I'm here to tell you about the uh, plan development proposal for Floridian Town Center. Um, you've recently seen this for the comprehensive plan amendment, which was last month, adopted last month, and uh, this is the next step in that process. So I'll run the f through the first couple of slides quick because Phil already um, basically went over these with his slides. Um, so included in the PD submittal, just uh, for your information, we also included uh, drafts for the development agreement, the transportation credit agreement, and the utility agreement, which as I understand will come before you at the adoption hearing. Um, because uh, because the, it may be difficult to see, I've tried to break it, uh, break some details down for you um, a little bit more succinctly, but uh, with some colors. But um, you'll note, um, obviously, we have the 429 bordering the property to the east, with the uh, interchange here at the connector road. Um, we have several uh, major public roadways proposed with the project. We have the main entrance, which is. Uh, Floridian Town Center Boulevard coming up to a roundabout intersection here. Um, the cross street here is uh, an extension of South Fork uh, from Pl uh, Plymouth Sorrento, which will have uh, turn lanes. Uh, we also have coming from the roundabout up to, um, up to the Stanton Ridge neighborhood connection, future connection, uh, is Kiowa Avenue. And then uh, in later phases, we will have a further extension of South Fork to the west out to the property line. Um, at this time, we are not proposing a, a further connection to Hermit Smith, and that's reflected in our traffic study that, that there will be no connection there proposed at this time. Um, I know that has kind of been off and on, but at this point, that is not part of what we're proposing. Uh, so the main access to the project will be off of the connector road, as Phil said. Um, there, obviously, there'll also be the connection here uh, from Plymouth Sorrento and then the future connection from the Stanton Ridge neighborhood. Um, as I mentioned, we've submitted a draft development agreement describing all of the conditions of the maintenance of the roadways. Um, that by and large, they will be the responsibility of the master association to maintain the roads, including the utilities and the street trees and the irrigation and, and all those aspects of, of the development. 
Uh, there will be a master stormwater system that will uh, serve both the development and the roadways, the project roadways, the public roadways. Uh, there'll be a mix of dry and wet ponds, depending on the situation. <clears throat> Uh, there are two steep slope areas, which you'll see uh, show up as open space in, in various places. There's a, a relic sinkhole that is stable. The, uh, the uh, geotech study has determined that it is a stable sinkhole, uh, and we are proposing, um, we're proposing uh, portions of that sinkhole to be shored up with retaining walls adjacent to uh, some of the parking areas of the project. Um, adjacent to the 429, there is a steep area here where the, the, the topography kind of dives down towards the, the, the edge of the 429. Uh, the multifamily portion of the project is divided into basically three parts. You have the phase one, which is this portion here. There is a gate here that comes off of the connection of Floridian Town Center Boulevard. There is a secondary gate up on the north portion, which accesses the Kiowa Avenue. There is also a pedestrian gate uh, that also accesses Kiowa so that the residents, if they want to jog or walk their dog, they don't have to come all the way out to the front or all the way down to the, the, the entrance here um, just to get to the sidewalk. Um, we also have a future phase of the multifamily portion, um, which uh, will be an addition. Oh, I didn't mention that phase one is um, expected to be um, about 300 units. The future phase or second phase of the multifamily will be about 100, 150 to 300 additional units. Uh, in addition to that, there is a, a proposed ALF or ILF, that's assisted living or independent living facility, which will be about 150 to 180 units. Uh, the non-residential portion is in the, at the southern end of the site. Um, at, the, at the main project entrance, we have uh, some, some uh, retail commercial uh, blocks and then a hotel site at the northeast quadrant of the roundabout intersection. On the northwest quadrant, we have what we're calling the flex parcel, and I'll explain a little bit about that. Um, that parcel is today located in the HDR section, so it is part of the HDR uh, portion of the site. But within your comp plan, you actually allow uh, a uh, certain pro rata amount of non-residential to be incorporated into the, the HDR area if you're part of a PD. And since we're, we're proposing a PD, um, we think that this is a great future opportunity for a number of potential different things. It could be a further expansion of the multifamily just as a single use. It could be true mixed use. It could be a professional office, medical office. So that's why we're kind of calling it a flex parcel right now. It depends on how many units actually get built and what the market looks like at the time uh, that that parcel is ready to develop. Uh, we also have a, uh, a parcel for the YMCA. Um, and that is expected to be about a 40,000 square foot uh, building. As far as phasing goes, uh, phase one, which we have submitted a uh, major development plan for uh, that hopefully you'll be seeing soon. Uh, phase one will include um, all of the project roads, um, including South Fork, oops, just to the west of the roundabout. So we will not um, extend the road until uh, the later phase, but it will include uh, the entrance off of the connector road. It will include the South Fork from Plymouth Sorrento and Kiowa Avenue. It'll also include the phase one of the multifamily as well as the master stormwater system uh, for the entire project. Uh, future phases, later phases, will be the commercial properties at the front. It'll be the YMCA. Uh, the future phases of, of the multifamily and the ALF, ILF. Uh, just a little bit of, of more detail in color. I know it's kind of hard to get a feel for it with the black and white, but we'll just go through these real quick. This is the main entrance. The, this is the connector road here. You'll see that there's a new turn lane that we're proposing left hand, uh, left turn into the project. 
um, for cars going east on the connector road. Uh, coming into the roundabout, this is the roundabout. This is Floridian Town Center Boulevard. This is South Fork. Uh, and this is Kiowa here. Here's the main entrance for the multifamily phase one project, and you'll see the stormwater ponds. Here's the, the entrance off of Plymouth Sorrento. This is the overpass of, of the 429. Um, you'll see the section change a little bit as it goes under, and that's just because the, the right-of-way was, was narrow, very narrow, from the Expressway Authority. Um, we have uh, turn lanes onto Plymouth Sorrento and a, a uh, D-cell lane into the project from <coughs> Plymouth Sorrento. And the north half of the property with the, the, the majority of the phase one uh, multifamily you'll see here, the, the, the main entrance was down here, the secondary entrance up here. Uh, we're proposing a wayfinding master plan uh, for the project that will um, be a, a set of signs covering the entire project, not just a single project. So this will be what all the developments will um, abide by, uh, regardless of where they are in the development. A variety of signs for a variety of uses, including, including uh, just kind of your vehicular wayfinding signs, gateways, uh, monument signs, uh, a complete package of, of, of signs. Here's a typical multifamily elevation for what's being proposed in phase one. Three stories. And then um, so just some character pictures of some of, the, some of the ideas that we're proposing. This is um, to illustrate the multifamily character from uh, uh, previous projects from the developer. Um, some of the amenity concepts from previous projects. Uh, the, the retail town center, um, the character and the uses, uh, these are uh, typical photos. Trying to achieve the, the true town center feel here. Uh, the hotel and the ALF. And we're here to uh, answer any questions you have. Thank you. Any questions, commissioners? Uh, just question on the uh, south <coughs> entrance with the uh, Floridian Town Center Boulevard and the connector road there. Is there anything governing that other than just the turn lane? There's no new lights or anything? Because I noticed the traffic does move pretty swift around that connector road. Yeah, that road does hold a lot of traffic. Um, right now we're not proposing any kind of traffic light. I, I presume because of the distance. We do have our traffic engineer here. Um, the distance between the other two lights, I believe, is the reason. I am pleased to see pedestrian walkway with our former presentation. So. <laughs> I just want to make sure there's just a safety engineer. built into that. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Ayman Saidi. I'm the traffic and mobility consultant. We did the traffic analysis uh, for this project. And uh, uh, that's true. Right now, the current spacing does not meet the requirements for, to allow for a new traffic signal at the main entrance. Uh, due to the proximity of the 441 signal. But the, uh, with the current configuration as a left in only, no right out, the traffic light at both ends from 441, also from the ramps coming down from the 429, uh, provides the enough gaps to allow the left turns in. So there is no issues with the operation of the, uh, of the intersection the way it is designed right now. And is that, but that's just for the first phase, factoring that in. When the, it's all full, will there be any necessity down the road for that to be changed? The, the, the traffic analysis was done for the full development, okay. but we took into account, obviously, the access to the north and to the east. So when all three accesses are in place, the traffic will be distributed. It's not all going to be coming at, at one entrance. So, so that, well, that is factored in already. And I look forward to some wonderful restaurants right there. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my only question was, uh, has there been a meeting with the residents in this area in reference to this project? Uh, yes, it has been a while, but we did have meetings with the, uh, the neighbors to the west. Um, that was, I want to say, in um, about Christmas time of 2019. So it was right before the uh, pandemic happened. 
Um, but we did go through a series of meetings with the neighbors. Okay. That actually brought another question. Um, was there pushback on an entrance to Hermit Smith? Was there any issue with having that entrance there? You discussed that. Yes, we did at that time. I think that was one of the one of the things that we were we were trying to hope to get at that point. Um, there was some concern. Um, it's been a while, and I don't recall exactly um, how much was concern versus um, versus just questions. Obviously, there were a lot of questions at that time. Um, I want to say there was some concern about potential traffic on Hermit Smith. But since we're not proposing an entrance on Hermit Smith any longer, um, I, I guess we haven't really looked at that <laughs> since then. I guess I'd like to see the safety aspect of having that access there, especially with the ALF Center right there. Uh, but uh, again, we'll see how the community responds. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, along those lines, um, you know, the way that you have it stubbed out, obviously, eventually it will connect to Hermit Smith. That's the long term. Potentially, cool. um, the the traffic study shows that we don't have to have it for the for all the traffic to distribute um, appropriately. the um, The main reason it's there still is to access the assisted living facility, which is all the way on the, the far western end of that arm. So, um, rather than just have like a driveway, you know, access, we we wanted to have an actual road. So I'm assuming because on um, I think it's 176 of our packet. You have plans for a small gateway median way sign, wayfinding sign at Yothers and what appears to be, it's not labeled, but Hermit Smith. I would assume that that wouldn't be in play if you don't plan on connecting into Hermit Smith. The, the gateway sign, I so believe, is it, it is up on Yothers, but it is... That would be um, that would seem strange because you'd have to go down Hermit Smith all the way to 441. It's to it's go. not on Hermit Smith. It's on Yothers and that north south road that parallels the 429. Ah, okay. I can't remember the name of that road. What what is it? Gotcha. Okay. I couldn't tell because it wasn't the the cross street wasn't labeled, so that, that was a oh, my apologies. False assumption. <laughs> and then you mentioned the developers agreement. We don't have that yet, correct? Okay. It's still in negotiation right okay. now with staff, so yet you, I don't believe you've seen it yet. Okay. Okay. Any, any other questions for the applicant? Okay. Anybody for the public wish to speak on this matter? Okay. If not, we'll close the public hearing and look for a motion to approve ordinance number twenty-eight forty at first reading and hold over for a second reading and adoption. So moved. Got a motion by Commissioner Bankson. Second. Second by Commissioner Smith. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed, motion carries unanimously. Next up, ordinance number 2842. Mm -hmm. Ordinance number 2842. An ordinance of the city of Apopka, Florida, amending the future land use element of the Apopka Comprehensive <coughs> Plan of the city of Apopka. Changing the future land use designation from county rural to city mixed use. For certain real property generally located north of Kelly Park Road, and east of Dalman Drive. Owned by Lee Lee Kuhn, Lee Myung Jae, Nam Ki Yon, and Lee Jong Dan Nam. Comprising 30.19 acres more or less, providing for severability and for an effective date. Bobby. Good afternoon, Bobby Hall, Planning Manager. The subject property is located on the north side of Kelly Park Road east of Dalman Drive and is approximately 30.19 acres in size and has a zoning designation of transition. If I can get the slide to work, there we go. The applicant is requesting future land use amendment from county rural and to a city future land use designation of mixed use. The property is located within the one mile radius of the State Road 429 Kelly Park Road interchange. And as you can see, it's on one of the slides. Based on this, the subject property will be allowed a maximum density of five dwelling units per acre as the property lies within the neighborhood character zone of the Kelly Park form based code area. The applicant is requesting approval of the large scale future land use amendment to develop phase three of the Oaks at Kelly Park subdivision, which is located to the east of the subject parcels. And basically, Oaks at Kelly Park phase three, from what we've been told, is going to be similar to the existing Oaks at Kelly Park phases one and two. 
A request to assign a future land use designation of mixed use is compatible with the properties to the east, which are within the Kelly Park Interchange Form Based Code area and are developed as the Oaks at Kelly Park phases one and two. Orange County Public Schools has provided a report that indicates capacity for the proposed development is not available at the high school level and is deficient by 17.816 seats at that level. The property is zoned for Popka High School. The Development Review Committee recommends approval. The Planning Commission unanimously recommended approval and city staff recommends approval and staff and the applicant are available for questions. Okay, any questions for Bob? Um, is there any, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I just want to see me. if there's any potential issues with attaching to Dalman Drive, or is that part of the plan? Is that? Uh, we've been told that the uh, Dalman Drive connection is not going to happen. I've got an email from George Shoup with Orange County that says that Dalman Drive is a county road, and any connections have to be approved by the county. Uh, it's my understanding there was a vacation. I'm trying to go back in the slideshow. And I'll show you the slide. There was a vacation for one of these right away here. But it, we, are on, we have been told that the vacation was approved, which would basically not allow a connection to Dalman Drive. So as we understand it, that's off the table. So the entrance, only entrance is off of Kelly? Correct. Kelly Park. Mm -hmm. That was kind of a half-hearted yay. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> 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 okay, so the um, right-of-way is, I'll show you where you can see it on this map, probably this one is located right here. You can see it's a little narrow strip that goes up here. This is Dalman Drive right here. There's a little strip right here that was uh, petitioned to be vacated, and that's what we were under this, under the under the understanding that was approved by the county. So that connection's off the table, as we understand it. It's not going to be used at all? No, ma'am, correct. That's what we've been doing. <laughs> And then all the questions that we did ask you, because <laughs> that was like the subject of this yeah. week. Um, <laughs> when they start to build, or when they start to bring in for the site approval for mm -hmm. phase three and four, mm -hmm. Toll Brothers will have a community meeting with the residents of the rural district there. Toll Brothers will be required to have a community meeting that's in the land development code, so any matter that comes So that would board, allow the residents mm -hmm. to have an input Correct. on their development? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the next phase after today would be? So where we're at right now is transmittal of the future land use amendment. So right. all that's being considered right now is land use uh, change from county to city. Right. After, if, if the board, if the council decides to approve that transmittal, the city will send it up to Tallahassee. Right. They will vet it, and then if they approve it, then it'll come back for what's called adoption. After that, then we get into the zoning, and in the Kelly Park area, you have to have a master plan with the zoning, and that master plan would come before the board here, and then that would reflect everything, the design requirements for the Kelly Park form-based code area the uh, input of the neighborhood, if, if any put into that. So the community meeting would come before they, we see it? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that will be publicly noticed? It's uh, at the um, behest of the applicant. So the applicant does all that. It's not a city oh, meeting. Okay. So the applicant schedules the meeting. They have it with the community, the surrounding residents. Okay. The city staff does not attend that. Okay. Mr. Smith? And you say we're, we're voting to annex it from county to city, or are we annex, are we voting to go from a county rule to a city mixed Correct. use? Yeah, right. the property was annexed back on St. Patrick's Day, um, and this is being the future land use is changing from county to city. So it's one of the steps we have to get to final product where you see houses coming out of the ground. All right. Okay. So then, I guess my, my question goes back to the previous meeting, uh, where we're changing to city mixed use, but it's strictly residential. Right. It's because it's in the form-based code area, so everything up there, because it's the Kelly Park form-based code mixed use area, mixed use per the comprehensive plan has to be the future land use designation that applies to all the properties within the form-based code area. So that's what they're asking for here. But being that it's in the neighborhood character zone, uh, which you can see on the map here, 
it would have to be no more than five dwelling units an acre. That would be the max they could develop this at. And the existing Oaks at Kelly Park, I believe, is developed at 3.14 dwelling units an acre. And so do we have the option to hold in them to the same capacity, density, as phase one and two? Well, being that you're only considering a land use action right now, the maximum that they can do is five units per acre. And the, we can come back the, and do that. The density later. comes at the zoning master okay. plan stage. All right. Mr. Becker? Yeah, I mean, you answered the question, right? I think for the sake of everybody here, <clears throat> the land use is driven by them being located in the Kelly Park Interchange Correct. designation. Yes. Mm -hmm. So the land use that we're changing it to, and I'm asking you, I'm not telling, mm -hmm. is the only course when we're transitioning from county, because to your point, we've already annexed this property. Mm -hmm. The only land use that is applicable or relevant would be the one that you're recommending today. Right. Where the, that, that the applicant is seeking. Yes. So um, also, too, knowing, you know, a verbal from Orange County to talk about Dalman Drive and then, you know, the vacation that's already happened, I guess, mm -hmm. to the resident that lives on the south side of Dal Dalman there. Um, do we have to do anything in our motion to protect ourselves, make sure that um, there, as a council, if we approve this, we are approving it with no interconnectivity to Dalman Drive? We defer to the city attorney, but my understanding is this is just a land use action. Right. That such a such a designation or conclusion now would be premature if. if well, I harken back to the Hamrick property. Land use. I harken back to the Hamrick property, and I believe we had some language prior to us sending or transmitting to the state with an agreement that connectivity would not. Well, the issue, my understanding, is if that portion of the right-of-way was vacated, so there's no any type of connection is going to require the consent of the two property owners because now that's private property. Okay. Now, well, if, they, if they negotiate for such connectivity through those two private property owners and those property owners are in the county, and we have proof of vacation that's already worked itself through. I thought, because when I met with the resident last week, that was still in process. So you've heard 100% that that We've has been vacated and approved? The county engineer, I believe Pam signed off on that yesterday. Jeff, you want to? The board, county commissioners, yes. Okay. Real quick, Commissioner Becker, to your point, you're going to see when we come through for rezoning, you're going to see a master plan. Mm -hmm. You can shoot it up or down at that point as to whether there's a connection to Dalman or not. Okay. Right. This, this, they're completely separate. You're going to get another bite at the apple. Good. Okay. And, and a lot of what I say, I just want to make sure I'm getting that on record so we're all in agreement. We mm -hmm. can't just, you know. Um, we, and to your point, you know, the, the five dwelling units per acre is the max available, assuming that that overlay district that's going to be additional business comes back before us and we approve that, right? So there's a lot of moving pieces and parts to this. Right. There's a lot um, going on. One, and she's not here, she was going to be out of town, but one of the residents that I met with, um, you know, when we looked at the original concept plan, that original concept plan that was mailed to the residents there, right. assumed that that vacation was not going to take place, that right. they would have access to it, that Dalman Drive would be connected, and there would be a roadway directly abutting um, Orange County resident property. And the resident, valid in my, from my point of view, in terms of, making sure that the open space or, um, uh, you know, the open space requirement is more abutting the existing Orange County residents versus elsewhere within the plan that they submit, um, just for reference purposes. And then my last question would be, you know, there's a lot of um, documentation from decades past leading up to now as in terms of joint planning agreements, you know, overlay studies, whatever the case might be. From staff's opinion, are there any incongruities around w things that don't jive between those agreements to what the applicant's requesting um, and ensuring that, especially within this area, that the water uh, recharge, all that sort of stuff has been contemplated and both the county and city agree um, to move forward with these things? As, as far as I understand, there are no um, inconsistencies with the joint planning area agreement here. It's in our code. It's in our comprehensive plan. It meets everything in the comprehensive plan. If it wasn't, we wouldn't recommend approval. Okay. And, and the governor then would have a chance to look at it mm -hmm. if, if it were, were out of compliance. And, and to the applicant's point, I mean, this is going to come back to us in yeah. terms of a master plan, mm -hmm. a more formal uh, layout than the concept plan that you all have seen thus far. And so yeah. it allows us here up in council to, to inspect that further and, and, and make sure that we have every, all the concerned parties uh, 
opinions to the table. Mm -hmm. okay. so, okay. Well, I want to make sure that the, when you say they vacated, we're talking about they only vacated the portion that connects uh, Dorman Drive, not the right of way that runs the length of the property. This little piece right here, as I understand, there's like a little piece. There's a right of north south right of way right here. It's my understanding it's this little piece that got vague. Uh, right, just that little piece. Vacated, yes. yeah. Right, okay. So, not okay. that whole length. No, no, no. Right. Correct. Correct. So, if you're on property, it almost looks like a trail that you would walk a horse on. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, you know. The whole T. This portion from here to here, mm -hmm. this little part right here to the east of the cul-de-sac. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So technically, when that is official, official, this property would not directly abut. Um, Correct. Yeah. Dalman Drive. Yeah. Correct. Right. And, and that that thirty foot right away is like half of a road only in that section. That can actually serve as a as a buffer for the for the property. Normally would have served as a buffer and, anyway. And last comment, because um, I forgot, and the resident brought up a good point too. And we contemplated this when we were going through the new aerial conversations on some of these new neighborhoods that were going to have cars facing existing. So, in terms of that buffer, um, whatever type of buffer goes between, um, if there can be something that's fairly opaque to reduce any sort of car lights or car sound to, to do as much abatement as that as possible there between the two. There won't be a road along there. That's I, I know, but, but outside of me seeing a revised plan, I just want to say in generality, gotcha. you know, make sure that those things are contemplated. We'll keep that And we already contacted the, uh, the developer, actually Jeff Summit, who's the engineer, regarding uh, not doing a road that was originally proposed like that. So putting the road more internal versus, uh, and then that way the residents would about residents or Right away, that is now going to be residential. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions? Or either the applicant or. Uh, oh, just for the record, I did receive an email, I think we all did, from Commissioner Moore yeah. uh, stating did. her commentary or, or opinions about this matter as well. So just wanted to state that for the record. Okay. And right. for the record, we, we were invited to the residence property, the concerned party, because I did visit the location. All right. I think some of the commissioners also, because she yeah, had mentioned that. Right. Susan? I have two. Um, okay. There he is, yeah. Good afternoon, commissioners and mayor. William Chip Henry. I'm a lifetime resident of Apopka, and I have property out on Haas Road, and it's part of my plan development known as Rainbow Ridge is a 44 acre project with 50% open space, dwelling units of one dwelling unit per two acres. This is in com complete accord with the goals, policies, and acts coming from the Wacaba Parkway and Protection Act, which Orange County adopted, along with 28 other stakeholders, as I recall, during this period of time from the late 1990s to 2008, which was the year the Wakaiva Parkway and Protection Act was officially adopted. It involved three counties, Lake Orange and Seminole, to create a template and oversight for future growth in the Wakaiva Basin, also called the Wakaiva Study Area. Basically, that's 28 entities forming a chain surrounding the basin to strengthen its durability going forward in the future and to survive development which would impact negatively the aquifer recharge, which is so vital for the region. Rainbow Ridge was founded in 2005, three years prior to the adoption of the Wakaiva Parkway and Protection Act. And at that time, uh, we were part of a group called the Northwest Orange County Coalition of Communities, which represented Rainbow Ridge, Dalman Drive Subdivision, and many other existing communities in the study area, including all the way across 441 to the Chester Hill development in Mount Dora. So it just goes to show you this is a really big deal. And this was, like I said, what, 13 years ago? So I'm bringing this to your attention now to um, you know, recollect and bring you up to speed on where all this emanated from and the reasons why and how critically important it is to remember these things. With knowledge comes responsibility. 
I know it's easy to say, but you need to be aware of that because you're going to be on the front line deciding how growth occurs in the Apopka area in this region in the future. So to that end, I provided um, you folks with a summary here of some items that were taken from the city of Apopka's response to the Wakaiba Parkway and Protection Act. If you don't mind, let's kind of whiz right through these. Uh, if you have in front of you there, on uh, the first page, page six, the Wakaiba Parkway Interchange Vision Plan, I've highlighted that. Look at item number two. It is designed to complement the surrounding areas. And number three, manages and protects water and wildlife resources. That was on the ground floor of Apopka's creation of their codes and policies to respond to the Wakaiba Parkway Protection Act. So that kind of frames it right there. Let's move right along to the next page. When the city of Apopka defined their neighborhood um, residential outline there, you see in the text there, it says it's intended to be primarily single family residential. It will have lower density residential than a transitional district, allowing for a smooth transition into the existing lower density neighborhoods outside the one mile radius. Folks, this is on the fringe. That's on the northeastern quadrant of the one mile radius and is right in the heart of the most vital aquifer recharge area in the entire Wakaiba River Basin. I can't emphasize that enough. So you've got to look at it like, look, you know, I understand what your plans are to do. I'm a developer too, but I'm developing it in accord with the Wakaiba Parkway Protection Act. I'm not trying to defy it and, and, um, and, and reduce it, its effectiveness. Let's move right along here. When the pop, when Apopka developed their policies, you can see on the next page, policy 20.3. It says, and I'll just highlight this, what they've done shall be consistent with the adopted interlocal agreement between Orange County and Apopka. You may not know this, and I put in my email to you all, that interlocal agreement says that if a rural settlement is annexed into, the density cannot exceed incoming to two dwelling units per acre. Remember, I just made a note of that. Rainbow Ridge is one dwelling unit per two acres. So what's happened is in phase one and two, Toll Brothers has come in and actually circumvented that interlocal agreement somehow and 50% increased that to three houses per acre instead of two. So you've already got an encroachment, as it were, on the intentions of the Wakaba Parkway and Protection Act, as Apopka has interpreted that. I want to make that clear. Now, let's move to the last page. Policy 20.10. You may not know this, but the Wakaba Parkway, AK-429, was built right on top of a karst formation. There were sinkholes that opened up in that road as they were building it. In fact, they lost a well drilling rig north of Haas Road into the gumbo because it sank, and the geologists, you know, were not prepared to deal with that. So you're developing and building roads in an area that has extreme environmental importance. So let's move along here. Development at the outer edges of the mixed-use area shall maintain compatibility with the lands adjacent to the Wakaba Interchange Plan area by reducing density and intensity or by providing substantial buffers, landscaping, height, and lighting controls. Folks, I'm being proactive today like I was before the Planning Commission meeting. We know that the proper time to bring all the details is not now, it'll be forthcoming, but I'm being proactive to guide you in your thought process that this is going to continue to be a problem unless it resolved. Therefore, I ask you to consider putting a stipulation on this project and others in that area in that northeastern quadrant to restrict the density of development to no more than three dwelling units per acre, as Toll Brothers has already outlined and started developing that. Okay, thank you, thank you, Chip. Appreciate it. Any questions? Any questions? You said thank no you more than time. three versus no more than two. Yeah. Is it? You three? said no more than three or no more than no more than two. Three. Three are already three. there. Okay. okay. That got in there without objections. I was aware of that. Like I said, I'm a developer too. That's kind of what I expected. Four or five, that's just preposterous, folks. That defies, flies right in the face of everything that I've just read to you mm -hmm. and the intention of the Wakaba Parkway Protection Act. Once again, I remind you, be a strong link in the chain, not a weak one. With knowledge comes responsibility. Thank, thank you, Chip. Thank you for your time. You bet you. Right. I've enjoyed thank this. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh -huh. This is interesting. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Marion Price. Nice. I've been a lifetime resident of Downman Drive. Um, I am also a recent biology graduate from UCF. So uh, I wanted to speak with you all today regarding 
water conservation initiatives that the city of Popka has put forward on their own website, and I pulled all of this information from there earlier. Uh, so I was gonna read you some quotes from there. Um, starting off, water is our most precious resource. We all know this. Without it, life as we know it would not exist. Although it may seem apparent that water is an unlimited resource, unfortunately, it is not. Growing populations, increased demands for water, less surface area for recharge, and increased pollution all contribute to the fact that we need to conserve this crucial resource. So as we all know, Florida's population is rapidly growing. It seems like people move here every day. Um, so this is putting an increased demand on our freshwater resources. So the city of Apopka is, our source of drinking water is the Floridian Aquifer, one of the most productive aquifers in the world. So it's fed by rainwater that filters through hundreds of feet of sand and rock. Popka typically receives 50 to 60 inches of water, um, of rain annually, but only a small portion of this actually filters through into the aquifer. As things stand now with our current level of development, we're already pulling more water out of the aquifer than is being replaced. So what I'm asking for with this development going in at the end of Downman Drive is that it is a piece of property that we need, to, we need to keep natural, essentially. Um, I know we're talking about like, oh, you know, fewer houses per acre. I'm talking about no houses per acre. I want the conservation of our delicate ecosystems to be forefront. Um, so as the second largest city in Orange County, the city of Apopka has a duty to protect Florida's delicate ecosystem. But changing the land at the end of Downland from agricultural with one home per acre allowed, say, to an acre with, or not an acre, sorry, an area with hundreds of homes Apopka allows more strain to be put on our delicate, overtaxed aquifers. Um, it allows for degradation of an already hard-hit environment, taking precious habitat away from such keystone species as gopher tortoises, red-tailed hawks, and coyotes. I urge you to remember your own initiatives when it comes to conservation, water conservation, by protecting the land that we have. Those initiatives admittedly are, at, are aimed at homeowners, but it's up to you as the commission to set an example. Any questions? Thank you. Any questions? Great. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else, Susan? Okay, good. Okay. All right. Any discussion? Any comments before we look for a motion? You don't have to. Did, did you need to say something? Uh, yeah. Come on. Okay, you, need, you need to come up and give me your name and address for the record, please, sir. Hi, my name is Mike Tufo. I live on Diamond Drive. And when they first started this, the gentleman said, no, they're not coming down through Diamond Drive. Right. Through the course of it, I think that changed. Am I wrong, or are they waiting for approval, or they're not going to come down through Diamond Drive? They're not going to come down. They're no, not? No. I mean, it'll be, I mean, we don't have belts and suspenders, if that's what you're looking for. I think in the next... 60 days when, when it gets approved at the county the, that they vacate that easement, then it will be, it wouldn't matter what, what they ask for. I so understand. Is that? Kind of. <laughs> yeah. But, but, I mean, we, we, you know, we've, I think you've gotten a pretty good commitment from the, the, the board up here that that's, yes. we're not going to let that happen. So I think, I think you've got a pretty good, <laughs> Thank uh, you. got Thank some you watchdogs. You I bet appreciate you. appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks for coming out today. Okay. Any other yeah. The only other question, the only other thing to Mr. Henry's point in the material that he provided to us, you know, I, I just, again, I, I go back to staff and just say, you know, as we look at these things that are outlined in these policy conversations, do, does staff have things that you can point to to say, yeah, th we've mitigated this concern because here's how we're going to request the applicant to design, or we've mitigated this concern because X, Y, and Z other things, right? It's the assurances that the board has when we take a formal position on this, because obviously this is just the first reading, and it's going to come back for a second reading, then we're going to go through the whole design phase, planning, and all that sort of thing. But just to make sure that we have the, the, the ability to articulate back to the residents that these things have been checked and um, we're in accordance with all the policies that we've been provided. So I see head nodding, so I'll take that as a, <laughs> yeah. as a confirmation. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, look for a motion to approve ordinance number 2842. So moved. Got a motion by Commissioner Becker. So moved. Second by, uh, second by Commissioner Velasquez. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. 
Next up, resolution 2021-20. No, that was, we moved it. Moving then. up to 2021-28. Oh, that's 28. right, yep, yep, yep. Yeah, we moved that. Okay. Okay. You missed everything. Resolution number 2021-28. A resolution of the City Council of the City of Apopka, Florida, designating a Florida brownfield area within the city for the purpose of environmental remediation, rehabilitation, and economic development, providing notification to the Florida Department of Environmental Protection of said designation and providing an effective date. Good afternoon. This is the second public hearing as mandated by Chapter 376 Florida Statutes in regards to designating a Florida brownfield area for the property located at 1617 West Keene Road. The applicants held their first public hearing at the site um, on a, was May 17th at 6 p.m. There was actually one member of the public did come and did attend and did ask questions. Um, at this point now, the matter is to be brought for a second public hearing. The, um, app the applicant has shown and has met the five criteria under statute uh, 376.80-2C1 through 5 for establishing a brownfields designation area on the property. Staff at this point requests um, approval, recommends approval of the designation. The applicant is here to answer any questions. Oh, the applicant is here? Yes, the applicant is here. Oh, good. Qu Any me, questions? Yeah, one question I have for the applicant. Good afternoon, Mayor and Commissioners. Michael Schnapsteller with the law firm of Cobb Cole, 149 South Ridgewood Avenue in Daytona Beach. Thank you. You had one resident. Correct. What was their question? Uh, he asked um, what was the proposed redevelopment at the site? and asked um, um, generally about proposed traffic improvements at Akoya Popka Road and Keene Road. And we answered his questions. We said, we're gonna do a traffic study as part of the redevelopment that'll move forward with, with the city with the permitting. And he was satisfied with the uh, answer and he wished us the good luck with the project. Okay, Excellent. thank you. Awesome. Thank you. <clears throat> Anybody else, any questions? Okay, anybody from the public wish to speak on this matter? Not, we'll close the public hearing. Look for a motion to approve resolution 2021-28. So moved. Got a motion by Commissioner Bankson. Right, second. Second by Commissioner Smith. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Okay, next up, resolution 2021-20. Resolution, resolution number. This is. Um, oh. The final adoption for the assessment for the marketplace pond, um, just for the public's edification, it's the requirement that the city had to go in and make correction, take corrective action to uh, fix and repair that pond. Um, I have notified all the, the residents by first class mail, as well as a advertisement was run in the newspaper. And if the clerk will please read the title. Resolution number 2021-20, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Apopka, Florida, adopting a non ad valorem tax assessment role for the Martin Place Phase Two Development Subdivision, providing direction to the Finance Director for certification and transmission of the assessment role to the Orange County Tax Collector, and providing for an effective date. For the record, the set fee is $111.50. $111.50. How many residents? Um, there are uh, 74 parcels. Okay. Any other questions? So Anybody? when you, when you send them this notice, does any is there anything in that notice that allows them to call you back to ask questions? My, for I anything. give them contact information to yeah. get a hold of me, as well as it is a public notice that it is a public hearing that they have the right to come in front of y'all. And did anyone respond? Anyone um, call I have, you? I had two people call me. One was asking about a fence to put around that pond because there was a fence originally around the pond. Um, the engineer 
The city engineer determined that there was the slope on the pond doesn't meet the requirement to have to have a fence. Um, and we looked at it was about $30,000 to put a fence on it, um, which basically would have added to their cost. So we felt at this time it wasn't necessary based on our code. So we didn't put the fence back. Um, and then the second one, he didn't want to pay the fee. Um, okay. So that was it. So of 100, I'm sorry, 74 homes, only two contacted you. How long ago did you send them that notice? Um, it's been over a month ago. Okay. And this does say 76 parcels. Yeah, it's actually 76. Oh, 76? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. All Thank right. You. Look for a motion to approve resolution 2021-20. So moved. Got a motion by Commissioner Smith. Second. Uh, second. Second by Commissioner Becker. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed, motion carries unanimously. Next up, resolution 2021-22. Resolution 2021-22. A resolution of the City Council of the City of Apopka, Florida, adopting a policy relating to the employment of small women-owned and minority businesses for use in administering community development block grants and providing an effective date. Mayor and Council, um, the city has been awarded a CDBG housing grant. Um, we have actually executed the grant. You all approved the, gr uh, the grant actually at the last council meeting. The following policies, we have seven resolutions today. All of the policies we have um, adopted, what well, we hope to adopt, um, and amend them into our current policies. This is a requirement for federal funding, um, and it is a requirement of the CDBG program. Okay, any questions? Okay, anybody from public wish to speak on this matter? If not, we'll look for a motion to approve well, resolution. I, I did what? have one. I, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, in the policy statement, Uh, page 211. Page one? Well, in the packet it says 211 at the bottom. On the policy statement in the third paragraph, uh, it, it says uh, available to minority and women-owned businesses located within the city. So we're only limiting this to city-owned minority businesses only? Because of the CDBG grant, it is focused on city, city limits. Um, so we are saying just in general for, to the city. Are you, I don't understand your question. Well, I, I guess, saying he's, I, I guess my, 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 my question is, if there's a minority owned business and because they don't reside or the business is not inside of our city, they're not eligible to participate in this program? Well, they can definitely still apply um, as a vendor. That's one of the things that uh, we hope to um, speak on tomorrow at our vendor event. Um, we are open to anyone um, as far as contractors are concerned for the CDBG uh, program. They're just saying that as far as city is concerned that we are going to give preference to those that are within the city. See you Correct. The, the language is, is looking at, uh, as the city's looking at the availability of, of MBE and WBE um, businesses that are city, a city of Apopka businesses, and then in formulating or trying to put that state policy. But it's not excluding those that are located in Orange County or elsewhere in order to participate in the program. Okay. So, so it's, it's not an exclusion. Oh, okay. All right. That's, that, that was my question. It's a geographical preference. And, right. and the city and the, the policy statement does state that the city, the council can adjust the preferences, um, but it's a preference, it's not an exclusion. All right, good. So will we have established a, a registry, I should say, of sm women and small businesses, minority small businesses within the city of Apopka so that we can at least when we do have a project within the CDBG program that we can let them know that this is. That's what we're doing tomorrow. Right. Oh, is that what we're doing tomorrow? Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's the We will be establishing a registry. Right. 
Okay. So tomorrow, that's what we're doing. We're actually showing them exactly how to become a vendor for the city so that we can um, make sure that we're abiding by this policy. Okay. Any other questions? Well, thank you. Okay. Anybody from public wish to speak on this matter? If not, we'll close the public hearing. Look for a motion to approve resolution 2021-22. So moved. Got a motion by Commissioner Velasquez. Second. Second. Second by Commissioner Smith. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Next up. Uh, resolution 2021-23. Resolution 2021-23. A resolution of the City Council of the City of Apopka, Florida, adopting a policy relating to anti-displacement and relocation for use in administering community development block grants by the City of Apopka and providing for an effective date. Okay. Dr. Jackson? Just a note, um, with the CDBG um, housing program, we are helping those homes that are not meeting code. Um, so if we do feel that a home is um, beyond repair, we are helping those um, grant recipients with a new home. So if we find that we need to build a new home for them, we are going to help them with relocation, temporary housing, um, until we are able to rebuild their homes. Is that going to be discussed tomorrow, too? Are no. all these resolutions no. going to be discussed no. tomorrow? No. 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 Tomorrow is just for vendors, so helping contractors to get on okay. board with our new procurement all right, system. So then I can ask a question on this one. Um, so a tenant assistance relocation in real property, will there be a guideline for these residents to, to understand if they qualify for this? Oh, absolutely. Um, so the next steps are, um, so we've um, executed the actual agreement. So next steps, we will bring in our citizen advisory task force, and that's actually one of the policies, making sure that we're bringing in the citizens. Um, and during that process, we will meet with the task force and establish these policies um, as far as the requirements. We know that anyone that is receiving the funding has to be from a low to moderate <laughs> income home. Um, and the CDBG program has certain qualifications, but the citizens will be a part of um, that whole journey and actually establishing those policies. And we'll bring that before you all um, before we proceed. Do we have a citizen tax force? We do. We do. That was one of the requirements before we could actually even submit the grant. Oh, okay. Well, I'm not aware of the citizen tax force. The We've brought it before the, the council before. I'm not sure how many how long ago it was, but we did do that yeah. last year. Do we have a list of that? We actually Citizen do. Task Force? Absolutely. Okay. So, Ed, when you get a moment, I guess, provide that list. Because yeah, I, yeah. I don't... I think we, we, did, I think we did that last year, so we'll get up. And... Right. Okay. So, so we did it last summer. We met with the task force. The task force actually came in here, had a meeting. We had um, several meetings. Um, and we were actually, that was one of the requirements. In order to get this type of funding, you have to engage the citizens, the residents. Um, so we were um, able to, I, I believe there are like five residents that are on the task force, but we can definitely supply you with that list. When was the last meeting that you had with them? Um, we submitted this actual grant application in November, so most likely we, we met with the task force in the summer. So I would say we probably met with them um, in July of that last was the year. last meeting? Yes. All right. Um, of course, I came on in December, so um, I just either Ed or, you know, Shekenya, if you can just kind of bring me up to date. Absolutely. And let me know who the members are and right. what was the result of that last meeting. And if um, you'll remember, when we were building the community center, that was one of our requirements also. So we had a task force that actually um, that worked on that project prior to submission also. Okay. Yep. It's so, a requirement. At your convenience, just yes, kind of bring me up to date, and I appreciate that. Thank you. Anybody else? I'm on page 217 in our packet. At the end of uh, where it says standard condition, um, right below, what's that, 2.1.8, it says failure to meet any of these criteria automatically causes a dwelling to be considered standard. Should that be substandard? I would think if they met the conditions, it says failure to meet. Failure to meet standard 
Repeat it. It says failure to meet any of these criteria automatically causes a dwelling to be considered standard. Why would it be standard if they fail to meet? You listed all the criteria, so I think it should say substandard. automatically substandard. Michael. Yeah, I believe we may have a typo there, so we can we'll correct the we'll correct the typo. Okay. All right. And um, and then on page two twenty one, number seven. Uh, displacement of homeowners. It says when rehabilitation of the dwelling is not feasible or cost effective instead of all. We'll make a note of the of the typographic error. Thank you. Good, good job, Mr. Educator. <laughs> <laughs> I just do this with textbooks. So. <laughs> okay. All right, any, any other questions? Okay, anybody from the public wishes to speak on this matter? If not, we'll close the public hearing, look for a motion to approve resolution 2021-23. So moved. Got a motion by Commissioner Bankson. Second. Second by Commissioner Becker. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed, Aye. motion carries unanimously. Aye. Next up, resolution 2021-24. Resolution 2021-24. A resolution of the City Council of the City of Apopka, Florida, amending the City of Apopka, Florida, or the City of Apopka administrative policies. Procurement policy by creating community development block grant procurement and acquisition procedures and providing an effective date. So with this particular resolution, um, this is actually, like I've stated, um, what we're doing tomorrow um, as far as helping our local businesses, those that attend the vendor event, um, just learn about our whole procurement process and, all, and actually learn about our new procurement uh, now software. So that is what we're going to do tomorrow. Okay. Any questions? No, because that's going to be discussed tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't want to. That as long as that's part of tomorrow, I'll be there tomorrow. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Anybody from public wish to speak on this matter? If not. We look for a motion to approve resolution 2021-24. So moved. Got a motion by Commissioner Smith. Second. Second by Commissioner Becker. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Next up, Resolution 2021-25. Resolution 2021-25. A resolution of the City Council of the City of Popka, Florida, adopting the Community Development Block Grant Citizen Participation Plan and providing for an effective date. Jackson? With the CDBG grant, as I mentioned, um, citizen participation is a must. Um, so this is why we, we um, did engage a task force prior to submitting the application. Any questions? I just, I have one question. Oh, I see. What's the, the when they serve for the task force is there a time frame for them is it like a year of service in the task force two years so the grant actually the award period is three years um so we'll have them on hand for the the next three years to assist with um monitoring the applications and just asking for their their <coughs> feedback in regards to how we're doing with monitoring the program so how do the citizens get appointed or how do they get it's it's actually it's actually in the actual policy for the creation. Um, if you want to follow along, it's on page two forty two of your packet. Um, city may establish a task force. Have no more no less than five members, no more than seven. They can be appointed by the city council, and then um, the members serve on two for two year terms. So it's the the policies lay out the uh, technical requirements for citizen part participation. Okay. Well, you're bringing me up to date, so I apologize if my questions feel like they're redundant, yeah. but uh, all this was done prior to my election, so that's, that's why I asked, so I appreciate the explanation. Thank you. Okay. Anybody from the public wish to speak on this matter? If not, we'll close the public hearing. Look for a motion to approve resolution 2021-25. So moved. Got a motion by Commissioner Bankson. Second. Second by Commissioner Smith. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed, motion carries unanimously. Next up, resolution 2021-26. Resolution 2021-26, 
A resolution of the City Council of the City of Apopka, Florida, adopting procedures relating to complaints and grievances under the City's Community Development Block Grant Program and providing an effective date. Okay. Dr. Jackson? So the City has established um, a policy that will allow for um, any complaints or grievances in regards to the CDBG grant. Um, there is a, in the policy, it outlines exactly what they would have to do in order to file a grievance. Okay, any questions? Anybody from the public wish to speak on this matter? If not, we'll close the public hearing with a motion to approve resolution 2021-26. So I've got a motion by Commissioner Becker. <clears throat> Second. Second by Commissioner Smith. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed, motion carries unanimously. Next up, resolution 2021-27. Resolution 2021-27. Resolution of the City Council of the City of Apopka, Florida, adopting a policy prohibiting the use of excessive force against nonviolent civil rights demonstrators and enforcement of state and local laws against physically barring entrance and exit from facilities which are subject of a nonviolent civil rights demonstration, providing an effective date. Dr. Jackson? Um, it is the policy of the city to prohibit the use of ex ex I'm sorry, <laughs> excessive force by law enforcement. Um, this particular policy um, is in line with the policy that our police department currently has. Um, so really nothing has changed. Um, this is just stating that we will um, allow for citizens or individuals to engage in nonviolent uh, civil rights demonstrations. And Chief's looked at it, and he's fine. We're so good for that. Okay, any other questions for? I, I have one question. When it comes to blocking access, obviously, obviously not blocking the access, but what if it comes to a place where the capacity of the building has been met? Do they still have the ability to say, you know, for fire safety, things like that, then Absolutely. we need to? Okay. That's great. Yep, right. The statute is, is that we're to enforce the laws relating to access to buildings. So we are also have an obligation to enforce okay. the, uh, the fire marshal has the obligation to enforce the fire code. And the only other question is an intentional that it, you call out specifically civil rights or just nonviolent demonstrations in totality. That is actually part, no, that is actually part of the CDBG requirements, okay. both the federal and state, that it specifically references nonviolent, so um, it's, the nonviolent um, civil rights demonstrations. Okay. Okay. Anybody from public wish to speak on this matter? If not, we'll close the public hearing. Look for a motion to approve resolution 21 27. So moved. Got a motion by Commissioner Smith. Second. Second by Commissioner Becker. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Next up, resolution 2021 29. Resolution 2021 29. A resolution of the City Council of the City of Apopka, Florida adopting a policy relating to an affirmative action plan necessary for the city's community development block grant program and providing an effective date. With this particular resolution, um, one of the things that the city has agreed upon is to increase our minority hires. Um, are there any questions in regards to that? That's the basics for it. So now who's charged with that affirmative action? Is that the human resources? That's their responsibility. Am I correct in saying that or, or that all well, the departments? Well, no, this will be incorporated in our solicitation or, or advertisements for open employment positions. So the, the policy, as it comes down from, from the federal government, the state in regards to the CDBG grant states that we have to um, at a minute, we have to state in our advertisements that they're, um, that the city is an equal opportunity employer. We have to look at, look at the applicants and try to strive to have a reflection that the employee, that the, um, the personnel of the city matches the diversity of, of the, of the city. Um, however, the resolution and the, or, and the grant language states it doesn't, it doesn't force us to have to take a lesser qualified applicant solely because of their race. We still have an obligation to bring the best qualified applicant, um, but it's, it creates a, a goal to try to um, 
bring the personnel to be reflective of the population of the city. And just uh, an additional note, one of the things that um, we had to answer when we were submitting the application, we had to provide all of this information in regards to the number of minorities, and the city did not um, gain all of the necessary points because our numbers are so low. So, um, Mr. Smith? So my question is, what is the percent of minorities that are employed by the city now? Yeah. If I remember correctly, I, well, one of the other factors that I found pretty interesting is that minorities are, the only individuals that they consider minorities are black or those that identify with uh, multiple races. So if you are um, identifying as Hispanic, you are not considered according to the state of minority. And that was the question I was going to ask you because uh, I learned that. So what is the percentage? I believe there was like 67, if I remember correctly, the last time when we were submitting the application. 67%? 67 individuals, if I remember correctly. We can, we can find that out. Yeah, but I, we, we can definitely provide you with the correct number. But if I remember correctly, it was definitely less than 100. So what is the percent of minorities in our city? Do we know, do we know that? I'm not sure. I don't remember, remember the number. It's definitely mm -hmm. over, over 50%. OK. And then my last question is, how many minorities is equal to one-tenth of percent? <laughs> Well, no, it's, it, I think the one-tenth percent is that it's an increase at the rate of, and not necessarily the exact number. The language is it's the goal to attempt to increase the percentage at the rate of one-tenth percent, percent of the city's total empl employee base per year until it reaches the minority city population. So I went to law school, so I didn't have to deal with math. <laughs> but it's you're, you're measuring the percentage of increase for a year to year at, at that point one percent rate. Right, but if we don't know how many people that is, how do we know we well, gain the percentage? We, we could probably calculate it once I get a numerator and a denominator, and I can make, <laughs> make such well, a calculation at, at that you, point, because right now I'm dealing with x over y multiplied by z. <laughs> well, if you, if you take the same definition, if you're, if you're saying black or African American, the demographics is how CDBG looks at it, City of Apopka is like 24%. Right. So if you use that number that you just gave, 67, and just call it 500 people within our city, yeah, it's 13%. Right. Right. So we've got 11% to go. To be. And I do know there's a disparity between incorporated and unincorporated. There's a lot more in unincorporated. So I'm assuming this is incorporated Apopka. Right. We'll, we'll probably have to base those numbers, and we'll probably get a better figure once the, the uh, we do receive, if we haven't received yet, the 2020 census figures. All right. Do they consider women a minority? I know they don't consider Hispanics. No. I'll never know why, but it's okay. Well, I was curious about Asian, but again, you answered yeah. how, they, how the state defines it. Um, the only other thought comment. I, I appreciate your definition because I, I think sometimes people have pause affirmative action is that force based irregardless of their capability, you know, and it's not. It, the, our language is very clear as we look at it. It's an equal opportunity and that's what we need to protect, that everyone has that opportunity. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I'm at ease with that at reading our verbiage. It's also an opportunity to, to expand the pool, um, mm -hmm. to, to extend those, to have an opportunity as opposed to basically not barring them from even getting through the gate to begin with. Right. So not just merely status, but uh, capability, all the standards that we want, because we have that responsibility as well. So again, as an equal opportunity employer, uh, we're just furthering what our practice is and having a, a clear goal of where we want to get to. Absolutely. Okay. okay. Right. Any other questions? Anybody from the public wish to speak on this one? Not we'll look to... Close the public hearing. Look for a motion to approve resolution 2021-29. So moved. Got a motion by Commissioner Velasquez. Second. So, second by Commissioner Becker. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Next up, City Council reports. Commissioner Velasquez. Oh, you really caught me off guard. Um, actually, just wanted to say uh, congratulations again to the 13 firefighters that were uh, uh, sworn. Uh, took an oath yesterday and were pinned by their families. It was really nice 
to have our uh, chamber filled with families. It's been a while. Um, it was a proud moment for the 13 firefighters. And also this past Saturday, uh, attended the last Saturday sounds, which was, uh, was excellent. It, did it rain? I think it did, right? Yes. yes. It did rain. Um, so, uh, you know, we hope that our residents will uh, start coming out again. I believe we're going to uh, start this again in October. And uh, that's pretty much it. Of course, I had to miss some of those things, but for a very good reason. My <laughs> one and only daughter uh, was married on Monday in a very beautiful ceremony in the mountains in North Carolina. And now they're going to Jamaica, so, you know, both extremes in, in weather. Um, and so I did miss that, and it was very hard for me because I love our fire department and I'm very proud of them. Um, a, a couple of things that I wanted to bring up that uh, have... Uh, Come to note, if you've driven on North 441, there's a certain strong aroma of, uh, smells like an Italian eatery. There's a garlic smell, and I've already talked with staff about that, and so I know they're going to pursue that. It's kind of hard to stop odors, but, you know, we do want to make sure that it's not, uh, you know, offending the entire neighborhood, unless they really like garlic. Um, <laughs> so, again, I think that's important that we look at that to see how we can diminish that. And the other thing that I've brought up uh, is a graffiti policy, and and... You know, my concern there uh, is, you know, some of that is just simply expression. Some of that goes into the beginnings of, of gang activity, claiming turf and things like that. And we've seen it when, in particular uh, at uh, the store that's at the uh, end of Sandpiper. And as soon as one is painted over, another one will come and put their mark. And, and uh, I think it's important just to look over that, uh, you know, for the aesthetics of our community, but also... Uh, just to say, hey, Apopka is not okay with uh, dividing up territories and things like that. Again, some of it is just uh, budding artists wanting to find a, something to express their themselves on. But I think if we can look into, and I've asked staff to look into that as well, uh, what possibly some other city policies are, so we can kind of stay ahead of that and on top of that. Maybe uh, encourage their creativity elsewhere. <laughs> okay. Commissioner Smith. I just like to say uh, it was also great to attend the uh, swearing in of new offices uh, here at the fire department as we continue to grow. Uh, I think I told the seasoned employees that uh, I was glad to see some youth coming along. Uh, that's a sign of progress, and so I was glad to see that. And a, a great ceremony, uh, Memorial Day mm. uh, at the cemetery, outstanding participation, great ceremony, great speaker, and so it was well, well attended. I really appreciate that. Becker? To echo thoughts, um, I, I, I feel badly for missing the, the, the swearing-in ceremony yesterday. I was on vacation with my family, so I apologize. Um, I, I put a note out there on social media, but I want to say it verbally. I just say congratulations to all of those that were sworn in and um, are going to faithfully um, service our city. So um, thanks to them. To just a follow-up from last meeting, um, I didn't get any communication around any thought partnership, but is what's the timeline for having a feedback around the discount store presentation that we had last last meeting? Jim? So maybe okay, two so weeks or four weeks? Uh, okay. And then, again, I didn't mention it during public comment, but I think we all received another email today, which a previous request by Mr. Poirier, um, the last week, maybe, because that's what prompted me to send a note to you, um, Edward, around the ordinance that was cited around the, black, the backflow devices. And Glenn was able to respond back to say the ordinance that was attached was superseded by new language within our land development code and was also prompted to respond back to say that the new code requires basically residents to make sure that their backflow devices are up to standard and certified. And then lastly, that there was potentially a new ordinance that was going to come before council to expand upon that even further. And so when is that ordinance coming before us? Do you have a timeline for that? We're currently we're having the rate study, as you know, with the with the utility rates. That is part of the what we've included in that study is have them look at what would it what would a backflow program like that look like? What would the fee be? What would the cost be? Um, what would what would the um, how would that look from the city side and from the customer side? 
So that they're looking at that currently through the rate study. I would imagine that ordinance would come once they establish that, um, okay. that when they bring that back to you in their study to lay all that out, that would, that would be the place where the ordinance would actually take change to, to implement that cost. So the only, the last question there, so like currently what our current, current code states is that it's the resident's responsibility, but do we track it? And is there any punitive action if people don't prove that they've done, because there's a, there's a greater need for us to want that to happen, right? Because right. we don't want intermingling of bad water with good water, right? Well, but I think, and if you, if you look around, we're no different than any other city. We're all, we're all, the language is almost exactly the same across okay. all of the jurisdictions. We have a system currently, Commissioner, that we use, that we follow, that um, tracks the, the backflows that we currently have. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a system, we have a back, we have, you know, um, we can we send out notice, we can send out notices. Um, do all the residents do, um, you know, do that? No, it's a very, very small percentage. Do we have the ability to shut them off for that? Yeah, that's there where you could, we could shut, the, shut them off as well. I think that's why we're looking at this overall with the rate study, looking at what would it be, and it's, it's, it's hard, the residents struggle in, in, um, in, in, in compliance on their own, the way that it's written now, so that's why we're looking at in this rate study, what would it look like if the city took that on and charged a fee so that the city would be responsible for making sure that they, that okay. they were. But right now, we just don't have a process by which a resident would be, like, once a year, a resident is forced to prove that they've done certification and right. send something in, and we track that. That's what they're supposed to that's, that's the way it currently works. They would send it to us. We would track it. Again, like I'm saying, a big percentage of our residents don't, don't um, you know. Well, that's, what, that's the point that. I'm getting. Yeah. I, want to, I want to get to something that's enforceable and that we track and that we're able to say, yeah, we have this on our books, and here's right. how we track it. We have them. Um, we have a software that tracks them and, and mm -hmm. things of that nature, but that doesn't mean that everybody, everybody has not changed them. Mm -hmm. Everybody has not, has not inspected them or done those. So, and currently it's their responsibility, um, which is why we're looking at this other method that, you know, looking at some of our neighbors. And, and really, I, I think, with the exception of Orange County, I think everybody else does it this way and, and struggles with the same situation. So we're looking at, in that rate study, how would this look if we took that on as a city cost? Okay. And then pass that back to the customer so that, that we were doing it. Gotcha. <clears throat> and then the last one I have is more of a, um, I don't want to go too long here, but the, a resident had approached me last year around, and we had a conversation about this a couple weeks ago, the Bay Ridge Cemetery over off Joey McLaughlin um, Avenue or Road up off Plymouth Sorrento. Um, it's Orange County property. Um, I've, I've tried to send some communication to Commissioner Moore to see if there's a partnership available, but I've had contacts with the property owner. Um, if something doesn't pan out with Orange County, is, would it be appropriate to advise that, that landowner to work with staff to possibly vacate or donate that property to the city, have us annex it, and potentially look at us, um, take on maintenance responsibility in our budget uh, season upcoming? It's a two and a half acre piece of property. It's got some pretty you know, well-known former Apopkins that are, that are laid to rest there. I mean, streets named Shopke, and the Shopke family is buried in there in addition to some other people. Um, I think getting it, it's severely overgrown. Um, you can hardly see stuff in there. Obviously, I think it would be good volunteer effort to get it initially cleared out, but it's the ongoing maintenance that um, becomes a question. We can look into that, Commissioner. So if you, I mean, granted, it's in the county. We'd have to look through what the process would be, you know, if they decided to annex into the city. But we can, we can look into that and, and get some information, pull okay. some information together. All right, thanks. Okay. All right, next up, uh, Edward. All right. The same spreadsheet you see every month. But this, this month is actually, it's kind of hard to see, but you have it in your packet, um, you have the sheet. One, there's, there's some positive news on this for this month. Um, you can see that the, for the current year that our sales tax was a um, little over $962,000. Um, that's the biggest month we've had since COVID. So that's some positive news. Um, if you look back to, if you look at the percentage over the last fiscal year, and keep in mind, this is the month last year where we had the, the hit. This was the drop, the big drop, uh, or a, one of the big drops. And then you can see that it's 65% above what it was last year at this time. So that's some positive news over the prior year. 
I did go back and look at the year before. Keep in mind that fiscal year 2019, we're looking at 2021, and usually you have a growth factor. You should have a growth factor. But looking back to fiscal year 2019, um, it's about $56,000 less than what it was back in FY19 for this month, or about 5.5% um, lower than what it was in 19. So that's some positive news. And as you can see, too, if you look to the right, you can see if you remember on the last month, the percentage was closer to 9%. Now we're down to about 7, a little over 7, 7.5%. So as we watch these numbers come in for these months, as we move forward, um, granted, we're comparing to, to last year when the times were really, really tough. We got re hit really, really hard. So it'll be, hopefully, we will keep this, this swing. Um, and so there's some positive news here because it does kind of swing the pendulum back a little bit on when it comes to um, the yearly sales tax number. So critical that we keep watching this because this is, um, this is one of our bigger revenues. And so I'm going to keep you up to date on this. Can you just give a little background, a little review of the American Rescue Plan for those who are tuning in to us? Yeah, I can give you. And it's, it's funny um, that you say that today because I've called them the last two days. And I actually was on the phone with them this morning. So there's a formula in there on how to calculate lost revenue, how those dollars can be spent based on lost revenues. And I've been working with the Florida League of Cities. They are hoping within the next two or three weeks to come out with a, uh, an actual formula that all everybody can use, because it's very complicated if you try to read through the US Treasury's documentation and how they implement it. It's very, very complicated. So they are going to put together um, something that cities can use to help them calculate that number, which is very critical. It's important that we get that formula right because those dollars can only be spent. Those dollars can be, those dollars have a little more leeway than, than the other dollars. So I've called, called and talk, checked on that. Um, there's some, some issues with the portal trying to get the money right now. The IRS is having some, or the Treasury is having some issues with that, um, but we continue to monitor that just as soon as we can. I wanna make sure we get our first portion even if we don't know exactly where the dollars can go or how they can be spent, I'd like to at least get it into our account. So um, we're continuing to watch that every day. I continue to watch that every day. Um, and so other than that, I don't have a lot, of, um, a lot to update. They're still, the Florida League of Cities is still trying to get, get information out of the Treasury. So, but we continue to monitor that. As soon as we have inf more information, I'll make sure that, that and, you have And it. the total amount is $7 million. Correct. Currently, we're still sitting at that $7 million number. If you remember, it was 22. They came back and they told us that there was some mix-up in the way they did the numbers and how our city was included as a non-entitlement city first, and now we're a metro city. So, uh, But I will tell you, I have asked that question more than once, too, because I just would like to know at least how we got there. So um, they're looking into that as well for us to see, um, to see how that, why that number changed. Okay. I think it's important, too, to uh, realize, you know, a superheated housing market can create a bubble. However, a lot of that is people moving into our state because of the, the COVID issues elsewhere. So it's not going to be typical of what we've seen in the past, per se, but just looking at that conservatively, because usually what goes up, you know, is going to try and find its level. And with it being really volatile, it can do a lot of this. So I just, uh, again, I'm glad for the conservative measure of approaching this so that if that should happen, we can write it on out and just keeping that in mind as we go forward. But it's great to see these numbers coming up. Yeah, one of the things that was interesting, we just a report from the um, um, our tourist industry is that, that like the UK and Canada are two biggest, you know, partners as far as, as tourism are way, way down. And so I think these numbers are based on drivable, you know, tourists, not on international tourists. So we've, we've got to get them back if we ever want to get it back to, you know, where we were, you know, pre, pre COVID, you know, the 19. So it's a, we'll, we'll see how that goes. Did you want to talk about the ad valorem um, kind of projections? I got the, we got the ad valorem projections in. Keep in mind, this is an estimate, um, hot off the press um, today. It is, um, it's a good number. I'll tell you that it's a good number. It is um, right now we're sitting at the actual taxable value um, is a little over four point two billion dollars. Last year it was three point eight, so it's about a ten percent increase in taxable value over the prior fiscal year. So again, they just give you one number. Last year I think we were eight, so 
We're sitting at 10%. I'm trying to do a little more research and digging into that because I like to, of course, is what I like to know. I like to know what of that is new value. So we'll, we'll, we're trying to get all that information. What's um, the period, reporting period? So that, um, that is your um, tax year ending. Um, you have to be in in 21 to have it for 22. So this, so this is, so it's, it'd be fiscal year 22, tax year 21. So I'm, talk, I'm talking next year. Yeah. Budget. So it's 10%, right? A little over 10% increase in taxable value. Keep in mind that's a best estimate. It really changes. So, but. Uh, but the um, way that the market is right now, you would think that it would have been much higher than the eight. And that's, and I, I kind of, Commissioner was kind of thinking that too, especially, you know, we were eight last year. I thought we would be a little higher than that. But again, I want to, I, they just give you one number and I want to dig in to kind of see what, what has come onto the tax rolls. Because that's the important, significant piece. What has come onto the tax rolls this year versus. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is because of our mix, which I don't think is where we want to be, which is more residential than commercial, residential has gone up faster. You know, if obviously like some of the Seminole County cities where it have got a lot of office space, which obviously is empty. So their values are going down and residential still holding up or if not increasing. So it's kind of a, the balance, which doesn't work as well as you're trying to have, you know, more restaurants and retail it helped us this year with our ad valorem taxes, but yeah. Yeah, and then one last thing, Edward, you were going to let, let us know about our good friend there in the back corner, hadn't said a word all day about how she's got kind of a preliminary financial report. I, Mayor, I don't know if I should steal her thunder. I oh. think she deserves that, because I can tell you what, you this lady has worked really, really hard with her staff. <laughs> I almost feel like I probably you should let her come up here and we'll, we'll have that. You. She's the one that worked the long hours. <laughs> Just couldn't let you go without That's giving great. us some Thank good you. news. Hi, hello, commissioners. So the audit is still going on. Uh, it stores, I'm going to say, the end. Uh, we have asked for an extension just to make sure that me and Edward can finish the statistical information of the financials. But I have asked on a and I'm going to say it twice, preliminary, preliminary report <laughs> over the phone in um, the auditors. It's a new company that you all chosen, but he has says that, uh, and I don't have the exact count, but I think last year and the year before you have over maybe five, six findings on the financial statements. And this year, as far as he has so far, he only has two. And the findings, the preliminary findings, are basically uh, some accruals that last year in 2019 were, and I don't want to say booking correctly, but were booked under and their revenues. So it's a good thing. So even though there's still findings, we are going to correct it on 2020 that we're closing, basically catching up to the accrual. The way we were booking these revenues, we were booking September not in the correct month as an accrual, we were counting it in October. So the auditor find out that for the past year, that should have been booked in September. Mm -hmm. So we're catching up this year for 19. So those two findings, for me, with my experience, even when he puts them there, it's okay. <laughs> we can leave with those. So as a preliminary, we have great news that uh, the city of Apopka will do great. And it's been uh, hard work and great dedication from the current employees and myself and the support of Edward and the mayor. Thank you. Good, thank you. Good job, Cloud Mayor. Appreciate that. Okay, Michael. Nothing to report today. Do you want to do the Rock Springs Ridge? You want me to do it? Mm. Yeah, you can do it. I can. I'll interject any <laughs> legal issues. Okay. Um, okay. I guess that's up to me. Then we're next and last and all that kind of stuff. Um, okay. The, uh, we'll go ahead and start with Rock Springs. I know that uh, you've got in front of you, Michael's, the uh, RD ordinance that um, he's kind of crafted from the one in Manatee County. So just take a look at that. My hope is that we'll we'll get to a point um, that next the next council meeting we'll go ahead and take it up and and um, and pass it out. The um, the other one. Um, they were, we're supposed to have had a, the three-way agreement done from, um, Kurt Artiman, and so we've got, you should have in front of you the small print, um, the land swap, and, uh, anyway, the, 
there's some things that weren't right in that there were or the things that we kind of had agreed to and, and I'll just kind of go over so I, I'm hoping we get those I, what I'm going to ask them to do is have something that that's that will get out early like first part of next week that so we get you get plenty of time to meet with Michael or whoever you want to meet with and I'd like to at some point have another you know community meeting out at out at the uh, amphitheater with you know be it sunshine so everybody can attend but yeah there's some things in that that the uh, the initial draft agreement that that aren't what we kind of had agreed to so anyway we'll we'll um, is this is this the one that you're talking about this one yes no that's Which yes correct correct. correct yes that's right. it. if it's just yes. a single back and front page yeah. what okay. they this submitted is just for the landscape. yeah they submitted to us instead of a three-party agreement what was submitted to us was a memorandum with bullet points as to what the agreement would have and um, there, the comments that are on those are basically where we diverge in any type of agreement as to the language that should be included in any three-party agreement. Okay, so it's the not body the, is who the, created the body here? Kurt Ardeman. And then the comments are mine. These are your comments. Those are my comments, which I haven't transmitted back to Kurt. Those were internal comments for us to 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 go over certain questions, certain terms that just were not consistent with what. We had appeared to come to a um, to an accord on as to what the, what should be included in the three party agreement. So when did you send this back to him? No, I haven't sent I haven't sent that back. That's that is that was what was sent to us, and I think I got that late yesterday afternoon. And those are just the in, the comments that will be will be sent back to to Mr. Ardman. But I wanted to send them to and have them pre presented to you also to to go over at least the very thin bullet points that we received just a couple of things that um, that we hadn't really agreed to one is the the tiff the tax incremental financing was only for if they rebuilt the golf course right the other big ones right other items we not agreed on upon the city is not going to be responsible for the cost of every election the district is to have the city agreed that the city would fund the initial election which would actually be the referendum to create the district but the city will not fund their their elections to elect board of supervisors or any of their other further referendum questions in regards to bond spending. Um, there's um, some disagreement into what responsibilities the city has as to um, contributions to their irrigation systems and other repairs, which were not items that were necessarily discussed between the um, the parties that we'll have to go back to. Um, to them to state that we didn't come to an agreement nor did we propose nor necessarily accept those um, requests that they have placed upon the city in regards to the condition of the golf course properties going back to them or going to them and the discount on the water was based on a golf course and just the golf course not the homeowner association properties because if you if I give them a discount on their homeowner association properties I've got to give it to every community across the city so if they want to do a golf course then we could be consistent that if Errol were to come up with a plan and they want to go to a golf course we could give them a, a a special golf course rate but we can't we're not we're not here to, to give Rock Springs Ridge a discount on their on their reclaimed water for their their right-of-ways and the the, uh, the entrances and all that so anyway if you've got any questions for Michael just Feel free to reach out to him. Um, my, my hope is we get something that we can we can take up next council meeting to, to pass out. So if we get a, an agreement that we feel comfortable with, we would take it to a community meeting out at the amphitheater and then bring it up to the council meeting. But I was ready to put some dates on it, but I'm I'm not there yet till we get a little farther along. So with this the second part here that. The this, RD that, that, this that one, the Michael ordinance. Rodriguez, it's ready to go. Right, that's this the, one is ready to the, go. Or, the actual ordinance, the draft ordinance, it's the heading ordinance number XXXX. That, that is a draft ordinance that has already been sent to Mr. Ardman, the attorney for the HOA, for his review. I haven't received any comments back, but that is what would be presented to the council for a vote. And if approved, by, if the vote is approved by the council, then this ordinance and the ordinance includes the ballot question, is what would be put on the ballot for the residents of Rock Springs Ridge to vote upon for the creation of the recreation district. 
So you're planning to bring this back for the next city council meeting? Yeah. Um, when are you planning to have the community meeting? I mean, is, is the residents going to have enough time yeah. to look this over? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> I don't yeah, know. I mean, to that, to that end, how, how, how will it be communicated back to this board yeah. what the Rock Springs Ridge sentiment is for us to be, like, yeah. I would need some sort of information or Confidence. Well, I mean, we can yeah. we can wait as long as y'all want to wait. I'm, I'm not. Yeah, I, I no, would no, like I, to do that. I, I just how how would like assuming it's tomorrow, how would that happen? Or if it's three months from now, how would that happen? How do we understand like when we when we go to pass this ordinance? <clears throat> how do we feel confident that the majority of we well, we'd have a, we'd have that community meeting out at out mm -hmm. the amphitheater. Here here is the we would send it out. We would have you know we would uh, we'd publish in the paper. We would have the community meeting. We'd have it on our our the Rock Springs Ridge Facebook, I mean our our website, so that the the community could take a look at that ordinance and and the buy sell agreement, and give them a couple of days for sure before we had that community meeting. Who and uh, being tri party, who's who's to, at the table on this sort of stuff from the HOA? Is it their attorney? Who's correct? Okay. That's Kurt Ardman. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, no, because the way that I, I interpret this playing out, right, is you, you've got the draft ordinance. Right? We all come up here and we entertain this piece of business. We either vote for it or we don't vote for it. Right. If, it's some, if it does pass, then that's what you're saying is would go to the referendum that people vote on. Co correct. Correct. And if assuming you, that passes, then the RDD is created. Correct. So correct. Where, where I want to have confidence is... The, the details that Rock Springs Ridge residents have in hand, they're making a, a good decision, a, a, an educated decision, not based of hyperbole and, and great emotions. And that's not, I'm looking at you, but that's not for you to solve. <laughs> Sorry. I'm, I, yeah. and I'm thinking, but I mean, that's, that's really up to the residents of right. Rock Springs to, to, um, to weigh the impacts of what a recreation district will do, um, and then whether or not—I mean, we there there can be polls. We can the residents can poll themselves, but like has been said, the ultimate poll is an actual election. You may have poll results, but you don't know their end results until you actually—you know—in this case, it's a mail-in ballot. But until you flip that lever on the uh, in the uh, for the ballot, you're you don't have the the exact results, but. Um, what this ordinance does is it creates the body that would be able to, to be the entity that would take title um, eventually from. Now, I think, I believe the idea of the tri-party agreement is that the three parties to the agreement would be the developer, the city, and the homeowners association. However, then that is trans, the properties or whatever is transferred from the HOA to the recreation district, that's going to be between them. But any type of financial liability as it regards the city is going to belong to the HOA or whoever the HOA is going to assi is assigning that to whether it be at the recreation district yeah and I get all the inner working so my big thing is just again educating people in Rock Springs Ridge to say hey if we were in this tri-party if we're selling it to uh, the owner uh, that property that has value and understanding those Rock Springs Ridge residents, how do they interpret and internalize what the value of the, the true value of that property is? Are they willing to pay more for something that may be overappraised? And then obviously all the, the operational costs that need to be considered and, you know, if they went back to a golf course, what that cost looks like. I know we've said in previous meetings that that's not the responsibility of the city, though with all these community meetings, I think there might be an idea that Rock Springs Ridge are leaning on the city to provide some sort of guidance, some sort of feedback in terms of what those costs might look like because we're a little bit more maybe in tune with what those might be. Well, at, at, at the end of the day, how they're going to operate their land is a, is a determination for the residents, whether through the HOA or through the recreation district on their end, there to, to be able to determine. I don't think it's the city doesn't necessarily have an obligation to state, it's gonna cost you X to run a golf course, it's gonna cost you Y to run a passive park, it's gonna cost you Z if you're gonna just keep it as um, mm. wild conservation lands. Um, that is for, that is actually 
what the purpose of the recreation district is, is to do those cost evaluations, to do those studies, and then determine this is the intent we're going to use the property for, and now here's the recreation district's budget to implement what they intend to do, whether it be a golf course or parkland or, or conservation lands or, or a combination of the three. My concern is we haven't really gotten a real feedback from all the residents. I mean, we have groups. We have a strong group, and I said that to you. And then we have a very quiet group that's not really coming out, but they're contacting, of course, me. There's another community leader in Rock Springs Ridge that this particular group that's unsure of what they're buying into has been contacting that community person and saying, we, we don't understand what we're getting into. So um, before we even get to this ordinance, I'd like to kind of get a real feedback from the community in the majority to say, this is what you're buying into. And with all of this, I'm not seeing that. I mean, I'm not seeing that as a, as a resident. I mean, I, I'm seeing the land swap and we're gonna, you know, we're gonna create this recreational district, but I'm a resident myself and I still don't understand what we're buying into. So if I don't understand it, I can't convince another resident we're buying into this. Right, but I think the, at least in regards to the city's obligations, the end result of what the use is going to be is a determination for the residents to make and not for the city to make. All right, so the city now has taken C the responsibility to become the broker. The city will, the city is presenting the options with um, the creation of a recreation district being one of the options. The other option that's always on the table is the HOA can just take this over and the HOA runs it and they'd be the third party and not create a district if, if the HOA can fund the acquisition of the land. That's always been on the table. Um, but the actual implementation of, I guess to put in some illustrative terms, it's the dog chasing the car. Once you catch the car, then it's up to the residents to figure out what you're gonna do with the car. And, and, and it's, we, we've given you different, we've provided different instruments for implementing the ultimate goal, which is to have title to the, to the golf course. Once you have the golf course, that's up to the residents to, to decide what to do with it. Um, the city's obligation is we have this opportunity for the, for the land to be presented to the residents um, in a fashion that may actually be beneficial to the residents. Now, once you residents get it, that's up to the residents to decide how they want to use it. The, the role of the city at that point is done, is complete. So I, I guess at this point, then, it would be that I would have to refer uh, to the HOA to ask them to go out into the community and get some kind of consensus. It, it's, it's been our understanding, I think, that we've been waiting for the HOA to come back to us to state, well, what is, what is the consensus of the residents? And, and the city is, I would advise the city not to get involved in any type of interpolitical debates between the residents no. of, of the neighborhood and, and their association. That's not a role, that's not a, an argument or a discussion for the city to get involved in or the city to take sides in. No. City's only concern is we are presenting the property to the residents. Residents need to come up with a consensus as to what is the instrument or what is the entity that is going to be the end result in taking, taking this property and then operating it or doing it with, with it as they please. Well, okay. and, I mean, he goes even, I mean, the first question is, do you want it? And, and there's the price is the 2.4 million. The, that's the big, that's the big question. Do right. they want it? So we, right. we don't have that at all. I mean, we just well, have I mean, we had a 80, lot of, I bet we had, we only had four people that, that said they were against it at the last, I mean, and there might be, a, I'm sure there's a lot more that are against it than were at the when last When you say four meeting. people, four people, where was it's, that? At the, at the amphitheater. No, they were, they were only, that was probably just a third 
of right. our residents. I I, no, I didn't say that. I just said that of all the people, we only had four or five people that raised their hands. They were against it. I, I'm not. The rest of them was afraid to. They didn't yeah, want to be yeah, assassinated. Yeah, right. No, I, I agree. Right. <laughs> I agree. Uh, well, I, in, I mean, so at this point, I, I, I guess I'm going to have to refer to the HOA and say for them to kind of get a consensus from all the residents. Correct. Because um, at the at the community, we did have a big presentation. It was, but I would, considering that I know how big that community is, four or 500 people showing up, could have been multiple people from one home, still was less than a third. Yeah. Still, but since that meeting, since that meeting, there have been a lot of more voices quietly calling or, or sending either texts or calling me. And obviously there's another community leader that I have been in contact with that a lot have contacted her and said, you know, we, we don't know what, we get, what we're buying into. So at this point, I'm, I'm going to have to refer back to the HOA. Um, the only thing is I just don't want this rushed that it comes before us and we don't really have a true, not a true consensus, but a general consensus. Again, it's, it's not it, fair to the city to go through the whole expense to have this done. No, correct. And I, I, I and, agree with you and, there. And I would, I would counsel and then at that. And it fails. Correct. I would counsel that you would, you would want to see that there is a consensus to move forward, to go forward with the election. Exactly. Um, however, again, we may have a consensus, and when it comes down, it goes to the vote. But that's it, okay. It but may fail, least, but that's what the vote's for. You have the most important question is that we have a general consensus of our residents. And I can tell you that I have actually met some residents that have said, oh, we're so happy the city is buying the golf course for us. <laughs> that is so wrong. And I'm like, no, we're, they're not buying it for us. And so I have to correct that. So, again, you know, I can keep going back and forth, but I will contact the HOA and kind of say to them, we need to, they need to go out and get a general consensus. I think the most important thing is in regards to the city's position and the city's actions in this, that it's been fairly clear that what we're looking at accomplishing is a land swap right. in which the developer and the city are swapping the golf course for the city's lands. And then once the city has tie, has obtained the course through the land swap, that the city is conveying the course to the association or the recreation district, the city is going to be paid for that conveyance. We're not donating, we're not giving it for free. How that will then be implemented, whether it be through the HOA, through the recreation district, that's the determination for the residents to make. But I think that when you've got, there's like three steps here, it's clear that what steps one and two are, and that is that is public knowledge and that's been expressed. Step three is that acquisition of the course by the residents. That's for the residents to decide how we want to do this via an HOA or via a recreation district. But that this entire transaction does not stop at step two. There is a step three. Okay. Okay. Well, I will, I will definitely just get in contact with them and just make sure that they at least have made the effort to get a general um, consensus of the community before yeah. this comes before us. Okay. Because the then there's other, there's other mm -hmm. things that will come up from this. I mean, okay. you know, obviously we would it would be much simpler if we were out of the middle of this, but because we've got the property that, that the developer will take in exchange for his property, that we're in the middle of it where we shouldn't be, but that's, you know, we're... You know, we're bringing, bringing a solution to a problem, and that's I, what we're... I understand that, and I mean, even the property that we are swapping with him, um, you know, I, I voiced, it has the tower. One property has a tower, and so I have concerns about that, and that's for the city. I mean, I'll cross that bridge when I need to, but right now, the bridge I want to cross is to get a general consensus of the Rock Springs Ridge residents. Understood. I'm one resident out of, you know, I'm one home out of 1,312. Okay. Any other comments? All right. Um, let's see here. Next up, um, Sheila Roque's update. We, uh, uh, Edward reached out to the, um, to a contractor, and I mean, I'm telling you, the, the materials out there across the, the state are just hard to come by. 
and it looked like we were going to be five or six weeks out even getting culverts to put into the into the ground and he found some that he he can shave and manipulate and get five of them up and running and so we think um, we could start phase one uh, between 621 and 772 this year phase two start 714 um, if the structures arrive earlier uh, could finish that by 721 phase three start 722 finish by 730 um, so we're just waiting it's it, we've got the the five they think he's identified that are in the you know out in the yard that didn't go on a di another job and he can he can you know craft them into something that'll work so that that's that's awesome so we'll get hopefully get um, those in the ground really really soon so we're excited about you know the, the contractor Edward worked hard to get you know something obviously we'd like to get it in before the rainy season starts so I think that's a that's a good a good thing um, Camp Weewa um, just had a, a meeting with the folks at Camp Weewa uh, they did get a survey done an aerial survey so here are the numbers that they came back with um, they added about from we were at 50 usable and they've got it up to 56.69 which raises the value according to them to 4.7 million so what I've done is I've given these um, these two the, the aerial and the information back to Integra which was the low appraised value company and they're going to take a look at it um, come back to us with a number um, you know, we, we had initially offered the $4.2 million, um, and they're going to come back with a number, and at that point, we'd bring it back to city council, and if it's something we, you know, want to do, um, we'll have another opportunity to um, second bite that apple. Um, DEP response regarding the border lake drainage wells, still trying to work on them. Hopefully, we can get some an opportunity to do some some water quality improvements without having to dig up 436. Um, so it's uh, hopefully we'll know that in the next couple of weeks. The I tell you, I was in in down in Sarasota, went down for the Florida Chamber Foundation Prosperity Project. What a great day! I was down there. Um, good friend of mine, Jimmy Petronas, was one of the main speakers, and a couple other friends that I've served with in the legislature, and. Um, so kind of the, the kind of the takeaway is that there are ten you know um, achievements that you need to meet to to get you know the kids out of poverty and they said that out of the, the state of Florida, fifty percent of all children in poverty are in fifteen percent of the zip code. So it was an interesting. So what they're trying to do is tackle those those zip codes that are in you know in, in the most need. But I just want to read just for everybody to hear that the ten. Um, pillars to reducing poverty um, it's lack of ep ep employment opportunities inequities in education and workforce development unaffordable and unattainable housing insufficient transportation options disproportionate dispro health access and outcomes food insecurity inaccessible and unaffordable child care unsafe environments imbalanced outcomes in the criminal justice system and lack of recognition and access within the community. So Chamber's really got a nice um, uh, website. If you want to take a look at it, you can pull up different areas. And it'll, it'll show you what the, you know, the rates of poverty are. It's, um, it's the FloridaFoundation.org. Oh, okay, awesome. Great. Thank you, Kate. So, yeah, really, really well done. Uh, I was I was. Glad that I could attend that. So if you get a chance, take a look at that. You've got the uh, kind of the outline of the the, uh, the event, but um, good, definitely worth worth a read. Um, when was the event? It was last uh, Tuesday or Wednesday. Was that open to even commissioners to have attended? Um, it was sold out the in 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 person one. I guess you could have done it. Um, this uh, is the first online. I've heard of it. Yeah. Where was it advertised? Uh, I don't know if I got an email. I don't know how I got that. Because um, yeah. this is the first I'm hearing of it. Yeah. That would have been something nice for the commissioners to have had an option to go and hear it for themselves. 
What? It sold out. Really? Yeah. Wow. So. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. But is it online now? Yes. It is? Oh, okay. Yeah. It's a link and... Oh, would you? Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Okay. Um, the Pulse clinical vaccinations we held at Kitland Nelson Park on the 29th and the 30th. We had uh, only had 25 people that got vaccinated. Um, we also have uh, Win Dixie is going to be doing a Johnson Johnson vaccination site either July 10th or 17th. Just waiting on a uh, confirm. Going to do it at the Fran Carlton Center. Um, let's see what else have I got here. Can, can we put that online on our city website, the vaccinations? Because I, I did mention that for Kitland and Olson Park, and some of the parents didn't know that they were, that that was available. I think it was on there. But. Yeah. For some reason, I had mentioned it, and, and some of the parents said, well, we didn't know it was there. So I'm trying to encourage parents to take their mm -hmm. children um, that are, what, 14 and up? Yeah. Okay, two last things. One, um, the obituary here I've got of a, guy, a great friend of mine, Jim yeah. Jim Sersley. Um, I just want to read this because uh, what a wonderful guy that he was. Um, known him for a long time. Uh, matter of fact, Jim Sersley sold me my first house in 1980. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, so what we're going to do is on uh, tomorrow through the Sunday, we're going to have uh, the flag at half mass in his honor. Uh, Well-deserved sure. individual. Um, on Sunday, May 30th, 2021, we learned of the passing of the Combat Disabled Veteran and DAV Disabled American Veterans Past National Commander Jim James Sersley, who resided in Apopka, Florida. Jim enlisted in the U.S. Army in 1966 and volunteered to serve in Vietnam. It was during the Vietnam War in January of, two, of 1969 during a combat mission that an, emergent, an enemy landmine exploding during a perimeter check. This resulted in him le having both legs amputated and left arm amputated. Jim then joined the DAV in 1970. During his time with DAV, he connected with younger veterans returning with combat injuries and mentored them. He taught how to accept the events of the past while remembering to not allow limitations to stop you from anything. We want to offer our condolences to his family, including his wife, Janine. His, he served our veterans and our community, and we want to honor his service. He was a father, business owner, advocate for veterans, and a national commander of DAV. Mm -hmm. We will be flying the flag at half, stack, half staff in remembrance and honor of his life and service for our country. So if you get a chance, go on. There's a great podcast that um, it's worth watching. It's a uh, on um, what's his it's, Roger Williams. Said that, it's I, Winky. Yeah. Yes. Um, just if you'll Google Jim Sersley, and there's one. It's a podcast that's about two hours long, but it's about his entire life, and I mean it. It will it will bring you to tears. It's just an amazing story about a, 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 an individual who didn't let his disability slow him down one bit so it's um you know it'll 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 pull at your heartstrings for sure what a great individual um last but not least budget came out today and we now have a million dollars toward our fire station number six so we were able to with yeah. the help of uh yeah i had i had help from kate uh, mate manly helped us a little bit i had uh Cinder Bracey and uh, Camille Brown, representative, uh, put the bill in, into, into place. And so we, uh, third time's a charm. So with that, we'll call it a day. Thank you.